testimony. McCain's family, friends, and John McCain believed in America. He believed in its people, its values. I fell in love with my country, he said, when I was a prisoner in someone else's. The son and grandson of Navy admirals repeatedly refused release until every other American brother was released with him. His talk of country first wasn't simply a slogan on a yard sign. It was what John McCain had done and demonstrated. McCain's lifelong friend and former Congressman Jim Colby conducted a wreath presentation. Imagining Arizona without John McCain is like picturing an Arizona without the Grand Canyon. We are grateful for his life and for his sacrifice. Finally, Senator Jeff Flake ending the ceremony with Gather. a benediction. Let us remember thy humble servant with gladness and cheerfulness. At the end of the formal ceremony, McCain's wife Cindy and their family escorted to view the casket. An emotional moment concluding this celebration of John McCain's life and service on what would have been his 82nd birthday. Let us go now. And with apologies to Tricia, we wanted to bring you these pictures live as the family of John McCain his wife Cindy and all seven children have arrived at the state capitol for the procession that will bring his body here to the North Phoenix Baptist Church probably in about 45 minutes or so and of course we'll stay on the air and continue to bring all of that to you for those who couldn't make it down here. Right now we'll toss it back to the studio with Emma and Paul and then we'll be back here shortly guys. All right. Thank you very much, Mark. You're looking live at those pictures right now as they remove Senator McCain's body from the rotunda where he lied in state overnight last night. DPS troopers standing watch over him. This motorcade is expected to begin at about 915 this morning. The procession will follow a route up to North Phoenix Baptist Church. There will be a road closure. Just FYI, if you're watching this morning and headed out anytime soon, 17th Avenue from Adams to Jefferson will be shut down for the duration of the proceedings this morning. And of course, all of this happening very ceremoniously as it did yesterday. Same way that he came in is the way that he's leaving the Capitol there. The family there, we see that the, the streets right there lined with veterans, volunteers. It's just pretty incredible. They kept the rotunda open last night until after 9 o'clock p.m. so that the very last people standing in line out there to pay their final respects would have the opportunity to do so. In fact, several of McCain's children came back to the rotunda after the services last night to shake hands and thank those who came out to say their goodbyes. Their initial number from the amount of people that came through, about 15,000 is what they are thinking. They really did keep the lines moving. They tried to keep people as much out of the sun as they possibly could. A few problems there, but 15,000 people came out to pay their respects. To the, the procession will begin uh, northbound on 17th Avenue to Adams, then Adams to the 17, 17 to Camelback, Camelback northbound on Central up to the church. Let's go back out live to the church right now where Mark Curtis is standing by with Governor Doug Ducey. Mark. Uh, Governor, first of all, uh, eloquent words yesterday and um, today it continues and then from here you'll be going to Washington and accompanying the senator's body. Um, has, has all, have you been able to wrap your head around all of this? It's, it's truly, I was thinking today, one of the biggest events in Arizona history. Unfortunately, it's, it's a sad event, but it is one of the biggest events. It's a sad event, and I think people are certainly mourning and, and grieving, but you see pangs of celebration and, and joy as we honor this, this wonderful man's life and, and legacy and how large it is and how much it has impacted Arizona and how much John McCain is identified and synonymous with the state of Arizona. You know, one of the things people always talk about his political legacy, they talk about his love of Arizona sports, uh, they talk about his military legacy. But the one thing that I don't think gets enough attention and he doesn't get enough credit for is for his wicked sense of humor. I'm he, sure he, something you knew about. Oh, he had a great sense of humor and he loved to joke. Uh, he loved to tell some of the same jokes over and over. I feel like I could repeat <laughs> some, some of his jokes, but he did have a, a great sense of humor. And I think that came from being a military man. I mean, if you ever saw John McCain in a VFW hall, you know, with, with other sailors and, and airmen and Marines and the rivalry between the Navy and the Army and, and the Marines, it, it was just 
great fun. And uh, you know, his uh, his story is is so well known. But I think the the story of him as a young man and and what a hellraiser he was at the Naval Academy. But then what is John what, Wayne McCain <laughs> at the Naval Academy? What a soldier and and warrior he became. And then his character on full display when he refused release. You know, the son and grandson of four star Navy admirals until all of his other American brothers were released with him. Look, everyone will opine on on his legacy and, and what stands out the most, but I, I can't let you go. I know, I know you're on a tight schedule. Without asking you what you think would be at the top of your list of John McCain's legacy. Well, I think this is a person that one thing will not be identified with him, but this idea of him being Arizona's favorite adopted son, that he chose our state. You know, 70 percent of the adults in our state came from somewhere else. This is a man that could have went and lived where he wanted in the country and he said I love Arizona it is captured and enchanted me um, he'll forever be identified with our state like the Grand Canyon uh, and we're all better off for it yes governor thank you thank you Mark. I'll probably see you in Washington I'll see you and uh, safe travels and Godspeed with the thank senator's you. body thank you Mark. all right governor Doug Ducey with us and Emma and Paul will toss it back to you all thank right you. thanks Mark yeah, we can see right there the hearse pulling out and now is when you can expect some of those closures happening out on the streets. Looks like it's going to be a rolling closure and if you know how those work, shut down for just a few minutes and then they'll open them right back up. Let's go over that route one more time. They're taking 17th Avenue northbound right now to Adams and then Adams over to Interstate 17 northbound towards Phoenix. And then they'll get off at Camelback Road and take that northbound to Central Avenue all the way to Phoenix Baptist Church, where the ceremony is expected to start around 10 a.m. this morning. And we're expecting to see a who's who on that guest list. 24 sitting U.S. senators, four former senators and leaders from not only the state of Arizona, but all over the United States. Absolutely. So at approximately 940 is one Mrs. Cindy McCain family and the hearse will arrive at North Phoenix Baptist Church. Senior Pastor Dr. Noah Garcia will meet with Mrs. Cindy McCain and the family upon arrival, escort them into the church for just a brief moment there. Upon arrival, an honor guard will meet the hearse and then stand watch. Right around 955, the ceremonial pallbearers will line up along the hearse. And I'd love to go through the pallbearers because I think that's so telling of the man he was, especially when you look at all of the sports stars that are part of this lineup. And not just the athletes. We spoke to Bram Resnick, who's already in Washington, D.C., preparing for tomorrow's events. And he said every person on this list was chosen specifically by John McCain. In fact, he called some of them completely out of the blue to ask if they would be a part of his funeral services and caught a few of them off guard. But yes, Emma, you mentioned the athlete Shane Doan, the retired former Phoenix, then Arizona Coyotes star Luis Gonzalez, who won a World Series for the Diamondbacks hit that game winning single in 2001 and Larry Fitzgerald who later today will be playing or at least suiting up for the Cardinals final preseason game. Yeah, I mean the list is quite long on the Paul Bearers who are all going to be part of this ceremony. A lot of them longtime friends of the late senator. It is interesting because each person picked with so much thought and so much precision it's what's not just you know friends and family but it's it's friends with a purpose almost to continue his legacy and to continue his ideology on partis bipartisanship and the speakers at today's memorial speak to the same idea mm -hmm. that, that you're getting across here um, i'm interested to hear amazing grace which would be the opening hymn performed by the brophy student ensemble um senator mccain and cindy's sons jack and jimmy actually went to brophy college prep in phoenix they've been engaged with the school community and they're and they're looking forward to hearing that um but the, the speakers larry fitzgerald as you mentioned will have a few words to share and then followed immediately by vice president joe biden um i think it's very interesting not only that biden is speaking but that george w bush will be speaking in D.C., as right. will Barack Obama, the two men that John McCain lost presidential elections to. Yeah, we talked to our political insider, Bram Resnick, who right now is in Washington, D.C., preparing for the coverage that we are going to bring you there in just a bit. Bram said that when he called former President Barack Obama, apparently it took President Obama by surprise. He was actually a little bit shocked that he would be asked to speak at his funeral. But again, a lot of people saying, especially um, Doug Cole, who we had on our show yesterday, who was a former McCain staffer. This just points to the fact about I, I feel like he's just so humble, you know, in his life that he would want someone who defeated him in that 2008 presidential campaign to 
eulogize him. You can see in the live images on the left side of your screen and to a lesser extent up to the right that there are some people lining the streets watching the motorcade pass by on the way to the Baptist Church this morning. We saw that yesterday as well when McCain's body was taken from the mortuary down to the Arizona State Capitol. Even if people can't be a part of these ceremonies, yes. they're still finding a way to, to at least witness history firsthand. Yes, we do know that 1,000 people from the public expected to attend the memorial. We do know those tickets are long gone, uh, but people are still invited to go out and to pay their respects. Right now, we have Arizona State historian Marshall Trimble joining us live in studio. Marshall, first of all, thank you so much for your time. It's so My great pleasure, to have Emma, you. Paul. When you look at uh, the events that are happening today. What are some of your takeaways with the people who are speaking? What does that point to with the, the life and the legacy of Senator John McCain? He always preached uh, civility and I, I watched him mature. I knew him when he first came to Arizona. Kind of, uh, uh, we've been friends ever since uh, I took him into the Superstition Mountains with some others to uh, uh, acquaint him with Arizona's beautiful desert. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, but he's, uh, he, he always, in his whole career, he's preached civility. And it shows with the people who are speaking today and in Washington uh, that the man uh, crossed party lines. And, and that's one of the things as a historian and a writer, I, I appreciate probably more than anything else. And I have a lot of things to admire him for, but that's, that's um, his, his working with both sides and trying to work together for a better country. Mm -hmm. And we need more people like that. And that's the saddest part about him leaving us. Marshall, you've seen the list of pallbearers and the list of ushers, and every single one of them had a connection to John in some way. And we were talking to Bram this morning from DC, and he said that there was a Russian dissident who Vladimir Putin had tried to kill, who will be a pallbearer for this <laughs> event. You're, it makes you laugh, doesn't it? Because yeah. do you think that's a little dig, one last dig that John McCain is getting into the establishment, one last little poke from the maverick? He was pretty good at that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, we're a, we're a state of mavericks. We've been mavericks ever since before we got statehood. It's one of the things that held us back in Washington in 19, well, the late 1800s and, until 1912. We were the last they finally let in. And it's interesting, they say, uh, you probably, uh, one wag back in Washington said back in 1912, it'll be 100 years before Arizona sends anybody to Washington that's going to make a difference. Can you we sent him Carl Hayden right away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can you tell me, I mean, you've been a, a historian for the state of Arizona for quite some time. Can you tell me the differences you have seen pre-John McCain and now post-John McCain? Um, yeah, he, uh, as far as before he came here, yeah. um, he he brought he brought a, a, a swagger I guess uh, to the to the Senate uh, and and the House before that, but there was there was just there was just something about him and he 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 got along with everybody. I just had a letter yesterday from um, a, a reporter up in the White Mountain uh, Independent uh, talking about when the Apache the White Mountain Apache invited him up to a ceremony to make him a warrior. That's a heck of an honor, is it yeah, not? Yeah, and she said. Uh, you know, she said, "Why do you, why do you, um, uh, why do you do so many things for the Indians?" Uh, and uh, he said, uh, "She said because they don't vote for you." <laughs> he said, "Because it was the right thing to do." Oh, wow! And that sums up his career, I think. You know what? Speaking to that, there is actually part of the ceremony that you're going to see today. Jonah Little Sunday is a Navajo flutist. He's going to be uh, playing a song during the ceremony. So I think that too. I mean, just so much thought in every single moment of this memorial service that we're going to take part in today. We were hearing uh, just what a, a scholar John McCain was over the last few days and that people don't give him credit for being as smart as he was. His attention to detail as a statesman, I think, is reflected in this funeral today. Is there anything looking at the memorial service in the lineup of, of, of events and speakers um, that stands out to you in particular that says that's quintessential McCain? It, it's it's a very eclectic, yeah. <laughs> uh, and the cast of characters is fascinating. And uh, I've never I've never seen a memorial service with such an interesting group of people. Uh, and uh, usually it's just the usual suspects. <laughs> these, but, but not 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 with John McCain. Yeah. If you're just joining us right now, it's Paul Gerke alongside Emma Jade. We're bringing you breaking news coverage as John McCain's motorcade takes his body where it was lying in state at the Arizona State Capitol Rotunda to North. 
Phoenix Baptist Church for today's memorial service. Our guest, Marshall Trimble, uh, Arizona State historian. Marshall, what kind of hole does John McCain leave, not just in the Senate, but in the state of Arizona? What is it going to take for someone to fill those shoes? I think he leaves a hole in the whole world, at least the free world, and uh, because he was, uh, he, he was the leader not in not, not just this country, in this state. He was a leader, he was a world leader. And it's gonna be hard to find somebody, but I, uh, I lived through, I grew up with Barry Goldwater, where it was, was on some of his boards and things. And, and I, I, I thought when Barry left us, uh, at first he, re he retired, before, uh, mm -hmm. but didn't die in office, but mm -hmm. he left us. We thought, all of us kind of thought, who will fill his shoes? And here comes John McCain. Wow. So it's my hope and prayer <laughs> that uh, we keep the trend going. Somebody else comes along. McCain spoke at his memorial, did he not? Yes. Yeah. Yes, he did. So six terms as a senator. What are some historical moments that stick out to you the most during those six terms? The immigration reform. He was he was for the immigration reform, and that was one of the big things. And it, it's it's been a long fight, and I hope in his memory maybe. Um, I'm, I, I'm skeptical, let's say, but uh, I hope in his memory that back in Congress, they say, let's get some immigration reform. Let's get this immigration reform. It's not rocket science. You're looking live at pictures right now of John McCain's motorcade. They're on uh, northbound I-17 right now. They're expected to exit at Camelback Road and take that eastbound to Central Avenue and then Central up to uh, North Phoenix Baptist Church where today's memorial service is taking place. Right now they're just crossing underneath Thomas Road so you can see that. It does look like traffic even on the other side may be slowed down quite a bit. I'm sure a lot of people who are out there on the roads want to stop and take a second to just be part of this, this historical moment for the state of Arizona. Marshall, this might be a tough question to answer, but when we look back 50 years from now at the legacy that John McCain left behind, what will be the thing that stands out? You know, is there anything that separates him from the rest of his fellow politicians of his time? I think his personality, uh, there are a lot of things. Uh, he is a bona fide war hero, there's no doubt about it. He was a graduate of one of the academies, and um, well, the Naval Academy. My son was a West Pointer, so I have to <laughs> give equal time there. Well, thank you for but, your uh, service, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That reminds me of a story real quick. Please. Um, uh, everybody's got their favorite John McCain story, and he, every time he would see me, it seems, he would say, Marshall was a Marine, and he said, I wanted to join the Marines, but when I went down to sign up for the Marines, they wouldn't take me because my parents were married. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd tell that he, over and over again. Yes. And, and, and I just I just laugh along with it. And the audience, of course, all liked it. He liked, he, it's that old <laughs> Army, uh, Army Mar Navy Marines thing, mm -hmm. and, and uh, it's all in good fun. You know, what's so funny, his, uh Someone who joined us yesterday on our show during our special coverage, Doug Cole, who was a former staffer, he had an entire list that he had printed out of the quintessential John McCain jokes. <laughs> the ones he would repeat over <laughs> and over. That one wasn't on there, so I think he needs to add that to the list. But isn't that funny that he, he knew the jokes that worked in the audience? You know, you are a veteran, and you said that a lot of your interaction with John McCain was at you know vet, different veteran affairs. Yes, uh, well, I was honorary chairman of it, uh, for veterans for the re-election of John McCain uh, one time. And um, um, another, another little thing about when I retired from Scottsdale Community College about four years ago, 2014, they said, we've invited Senator McCain to come to your retirement party, oh but it was at 7 o'clock in the morning. And I said, he'll never, he won't get up and come clear out here to Scottsdale Community College at seven o'clock for me. And, uh, and I, I just, I never expected it. And with about 6.45 that morning, we were all there in, at the, where they were getting ready to start. He comes in. Come on. He came in and he stayed the whole time. Wow. And um, they had flown my son in secretly from New York City uh, uh, to be there. And, uh, and my son just said, I cannot believe that you've got John McCain here. <laughs> I said, well, but, but he stayed, he gave a talk, and of course he told me about uh, uh, his parents being married mm -hmm. and so forth. Uh, he, he, he never let that one go by without. <laughs> <laughs> Did he say anything else to you that was noteworthy after making such a surprise appearance? He, he, well, yeah, he, was, he just talked about 
my work as a state historian, as a historian, and uh, I had done a lot of things with him, you know, over the years, mm -hmm. and ridden in parades with him and things like that. And but um, I, I, it, it was really nice. I, I just, I don't, I don't dwell on uh, on accolades <laughs> very much. I, right. I'm kind of, uh, kind of. Uh, just embarrassed by it, I think, sometimes. I'm just a small-town Arizona boy. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that's what maybe Senator McCain loved so much about you, was probably how, how humble you are. Well, he was, he was, he was a real, real, it was, it was a character, he was a character, but he was a fascinating character, yeah. and he was full of energy. His staff told me one time, he's, he's, he, he, he runs them to death. <laughs> he's, like, he's like a Duracell battery, he just doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. What did they call his staffers? Yesterday on the show, do you remember? Oh darn it! They had a nickname. Oh, it was Hotel California. Hotel California. Yeah. You could check out anytime you like, but you could never leave. That's the way he <laughs> treated his staffers. Yeah. Um, I found it interesting. This memorial service that's planned to start at 10 o'clock here at the top of the hour is is pretty well laid out. Tributes, readings, hymns. It ends in a recessional of My Way by Frank Sinatra. Do you think that does a good job of summarizing the life that John McCain lived? That's how I've ended some interviews here recently. I said he did it his way, and I said to paraphrase or, or to steal from Paul Anka and Frank Sinatra, <laughs> uh, he did it his way, and he certainly did, and he went out his way too. And you know what? The ceremony that you are going to see in just a few minutes is all planned out by Senator John McCain. I want to give you kind of an idea of what you can expect. And I'll start with an invocation by Senior Pastor Dr. No Garcia from the North Phoenix Baptist Church. Brophy Student Ensemble will then be singing Amazing Grace. We have a reading from his daughter, Bridget McCain. She'll be doing a scripture reading. And then a tribute by his longtime friend, Grant Woods. Another tribute by Tommy Espinoza. Then uh, the Navajo flutist that we mentioned as well will play a song, Expression of Love, followed by Larry Fitzgerald. And then a tribute by Vice President Joe Biden. Another reading by Andrew McCain. And another song by Brophy Student Ensemble. And you know, it's interesting having the Brophy Student Ensemble. Can you imagine when they were first approached to be part of this, what that must have been like? I think Senator McCain did an amazing job at reaching out to people that didn't expect to be a yes. part of his final farewells. Um, and then following that, we'll have a message by Father Edward Reese, who spoke yesterday at the Rotunda during the memorial there. A hymn going home performed by Jay Smith on a bagpipe, then a benediction and dismissal by senior pastor No Garcia, followed by that recessional we spoke of a moment ago, My Way, the original music by Frank Sinatra. If you're just joining us, 925 this morning, Paul Gerke alongside Emma Jade here in the 12 News studio bringing you breaking news of the motorcade uh, carrying Senator John McCain's casket from the Arizona State Capitol Rotunda where he lie in state last night to North Phoenix Baptist Church. We're at about 10 a.m. this morning. Another memorial service will be underway. We're joined live right now by our guest, Marshall Trimble, official Arizona State historian who has seen a whole lot of John McCain's impact on the state of Arizona. You know, I think the one way that people have been remembering John throughout this entire, I mean, it's been 14 months. What was it, 14 months since he was diagnosed with glioblastoma? July of last year. Yeah. Right? As a man who bridged the gap from the left to the right, is there any enduring piece of legislation or, or, or is it just a sentiment that he leaves behind that, that sort of makes that aisle a little more narrow? I, I hope, I hope, he, he lived, he, he, I hope he lived for this. I mean, he lived for this. I, I hope, I hope it's, it, they carry it out because it would be a great tribute to his memory and to his legacy if, uh, if we would see. But um, it's so polarized back there right now. And, uh, and that's, that's really sad uh, that. Well, he speaks to it. Uh, the fact that President Donald Trump was not invited to his, his service. Vice President Mike Pence will be uh, there in his stead in Washington. Um, what do you think about that? He did it his way. This is <laughs> yeah. what John, we go back to that. We go back to Frank Sinatra. Yeah. And um, I'm afraid if Trump, had, uh, President Trump had been there, I, uh, I think it would have detracted from the solemnness and from the whole character of John McCain. And we're here to celebrate his character, not to be upstaged by, um, by some, um, well, <laughs> just, just outlandish things. And, and, uh, and it, it's just, it, it, just the way it, 
The people who are coming here are in big respect, deep respect for McCain. When you look back including at his, his adversaries. When you look back at his life, what are some moments in Arizona history that you think we should remember John McCain for? The man. He, he came he came to Arizona. He was a he was a war hero. Um, he um, uh, he was down so many times. I, I read the Arizona Republic article by Don, Dan No No Wiki yesterday and and I just thought, man, I've, I'd forgotten all the times he just took took a beating in these political races, and um, it looked like it looked like it was all over, and he just bounced back, and he always would bounce back. You knock him down, and he gets back up again. Do you know what? I think he was never he was never afraid to admit when he was wrong or when he was knocked down. I think that says a what lot. What was about the quote too. yesterday? I'd rather lose an election than lose a war. Than right? lose a war. That's right. <laughs> yeah, and he that's always right. admitted when he was wrong. Always admitted when he maybe didn't make the right decision. I think that says a lot about him. It does because you won't find many politicians today no. that will that are do that will do that. And to do that, you've got to have a lot of confidence in yourself. Yes. And he he just must have had. Uh, you know, he's been a competitor. He was, he was a wrestler in high school, and he boxed at, uh, at uh, Annapolis. And uh, he's, uh, he's he, he's been a fighter. He, he had to be a fighter to survive uh, the the torture that was, he, for five and a half years. Mm. So he got into politics, and uh, you know, he's uh, he, he's never he's never down long. <laughs> You're looking live at pictures right now as the motorcade gets closer and closer to North Phoenix Baptist Church. You're seeing more and more people standing out there. I believe, are they on Central right now? Or is, is it on Camelback right now? Uh, camel they're on back. Camelback right now, it looks like. But yeah, you could see people out there with the phones just yeah. trying to get as close as they can to witnessing our final goodbye to a man that's been living in this state since he was, what, 45 years old? Yeah, just to give you an idea of people who will be inside at the memorial service, former Vice President Joe Biden, as we mentioned before, he will actually be speaking. 24 sitting U.S. senators will be in attendance today. Four former senators. Some other notable leaders, too, from the state of Arizona are expected to attend the memorial service at the North Phoenix Baptist Church. On top of that, they have about 1,000 seats that were made available for the public. But those tickets... You were able to get some online, some invited by the McCain family, so they are long gone. Don't go expecting to have a seat. You know, you might be outside, but hey, being outside too, just paying your respects, I think is phenomenal. We're expected that motorcade to arrive at about 940 this morning, so sometime within the next 10 minutes or so, mm -hmm. where Cindy McCain and family, all seven of his children in tow, will arrive at the North Phoenix Baptist Church and be greeted there by senior pastor Dr. No Garcia. They'll be escorted into the church briefly and then the honor guard will go out to the hearse and stand watch. Yeah, the armed forces body bearer team will then retrieve the casket and proceed into the church. That's going to be happening right around 955. You'll see the pallbearers there as well. Clergy will proceed into the sanctuary head of the casket followed by the pallbearers and then the family and that's where things will really get started. We're expecting the ceremony to wrap up sometime after 11, around 11.15 this morning. And after that, the body of Senator McCain will be escorted to the airport where he'll be flown out to Washington, D.C. The senator will lie in state Friday at the U.S. Capitol before memorial services Saturday, and he'll be laid to rest on Sunday in a private ceremony. And we do have our political insider, Bram Resnick, in Washington, D.C. right now. He's going to give us more insight on what exactly is happening there, the coverage that will be going on there. Mark Curtis will also be flying out to Washington, D.C. later on today to continue our coverage of this incredible man and the memorial services, I mean, there is just so much happening and so much purpose to everything that's happening that you not only see today, but again, later in Washington. In our conversations over the last few days, uh, Marsha, we've kind of been laughing about how what John would have thought about all of this pomp and circumstance in five days of memorials. As a man who covered him extensively, what would John have thought about all of this? I think he would have been cracking a lot of jokes. He would probably his, his, his whole repertoire of jokes would have given him a chance to <laughs> to run them by everybody. <laughs> it's too bad. It's too bad he can't speak at his own at his own funeral service. But uh, yeah, he uh, that was that that's something that we don't have enough in politics today is is a sense of humor. The, the, the people that I've admired the most in my lifetime, John F. Kennedy, uh, Ronald Reagan. Um, these, these uh, Mo written Mo Udall, for example, these guys could make fun of themselves. They could ha they could make you laugh, and people on both sides of the aisle loved them because, and I think it had to do with that humor. Mm -hmm. People love 
to laugh. Do you think that spoke to his success as a politician? Because we know he was an infamous door knocker. He wanted to go in every small town in the state of Arizona and try to, to win your vote. You know, we, we spoke about the band of reporters on the Straight Talk Express and the stories mm -hmm. that came out of there uh, during that 2000 run um, against George H. W. or George W. Bush, rather. Um, is that the legacy that he leaves behind to, to his constituents, to those that voted for McCain as, a, as an everyman, as someone that was willing to go up and knock on your door and meet your wife and kids and family? Those, he those who touched, uh, and I, I've gotten a lot of emails in the last few days from veterans who mm -hmm. said he had, they had a problem with the Veterans Administration, and uh, they contacted Senator McCain, and he jumped on it and took care of the problem, and, they say, and they'd say, say things like, I'll never forget that, I'll never forget him. Mm -hmm. One and, person and at so a time. It, yeah, and I, I saw a news clip the other night of um, when he first came to Arizona, and he was new, and nobody really knew who he was, except he was this famous um, uh, Navy pilot and war, war prisoner, but right. he, he was out in the middle of the summer, knocking on doors, and you could see his sweat uh, soaked shirt, <laughs> and he's just knocking on doors as he went. Now that's uh, that's John McCain, and he uh, gives it that personal touch. And this um, this woman, this reporter, uh, Joe Baeza, who wrote me yesterday, she said um, uh, he came to our little town. This is Pine Top, and uh, we're used to we're we're used to people coming in. We can spot we can spot a phony in an instant. We're just a small town people. We can <laughs> spot a small phony in an instant. <laughs> and uh, she said he was so sincere. And when he met with the Apache leaders, he just walked up and instead of glad handing and 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 looking at his watch and uh, this this kind of stuff, he walked right up and individually spoke to each one. And I've heard that many times in other situations with other groups. He would speak to you and ask you, uh, ask you things. And, and people, people never forget that because they think, uh, I, I'm, just a, I'm just a person and he's a famous man, Eddie. But he's, he's interested, he's interested in me. I mean, it says a lot because he moved here. I mean, Arizona is his adopted home state. Yeah. So wait, he had a lot of work to do to really get people behind him. Well, that was one of the greatest political lines of his career, I think, when that uh, they, because I can remember when they were calling him a carpetbagger, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, and I thought, well, uh, then and he said, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I'm a I'm a military ma family. I've been from grew up in a military family. I've always been moving around. He said the longest time I ever spent in one place was in the Hanoi Hilton. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> Boy, that shut him down. That shut it down. Oh, that. That sure did. Can you remember your first interaction with John McCain? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, th that was when we I, I met him. He hadn't been in Arizona very long, and um, uh, there's Marshall. We're we're we're, we're getting together and we're taking uh, John McCain out into the Superstition Mountains on horseback. And so, um, uh, would you come along and just tell Arizona stories and t tell him some tell him. Arizona history and I said sure so we got on horseback and we rode we rode all day long and uh, we were all used to riding uh, but uh, I'm sure he hadn't been on a horse in a long time <laughs> and he didn't complain he didn't it, he just everything was just in wonder because the superstitions are pretty amazing uh, if you go the right time of the year and uh, he, but I'll never forget that and I just thought he he just cowboyed up today he really can cowboy up. Was he in the House or in the Senate at that he time? He was in the House. Do you remember your last interaction with John McCain? Uh, it was at my retirement party when we that were. That was it. Yeah. We were, yeah, that was. That was uh, 2014, right? Yeah. yeah. And um, I wrote him a letter. Um, I wrote him a letter uh, about three, four weeks ago, just a, a, a goodbye letter, a kind of a vaya con Dios, and um, told him I loved him. Yeah. I think that's a sentiment that a lot of us are expressing, and I think it's something that um, we might not understand the, the the depth of the loss of a man like John McCain until, you know, 10, 20 years from now. And I, and I think that's your place as a historian is, is to sort of predict um, the direction that this state is headed um, and the hole that Senator John McCain leaves behind. Uh, if you're just joining us now at 936 this morning, um, you're looking at live pictures of the motorcade containing the casket and the remains of Senator John McCain. Uh, departed the Arizona State Capitol Rotunda uh, about half an hour or so ago. Mm -hmm. They are getting very close to North Phoenix Baptist Church where a ceremony celebrating his life and legacy will begin at 10 a.m. this morning. 
Let's go through, Emma, one last time, um, the, the people that we're expected to see at this ceremony, those who will be speaking, and, and the group of pallbearers um, that will be out there as well, because it's really a who's who in the state of Arizona and our nation at large. And our nation at large is right. 24 sitting U.S. senators will all be in attendance today for former senators. And, of course, former Vice President Joe Biden will be there. Uh, he's actually going to be speaking. So if we go through exactly what's going to happen, once this memorial service starts right around 10 a.m., there'll be a welcome and an invocation by senior pastor You're there. Seeing the Red for Ed uh, movement out there in support yeah, right now. All the that. red That's shirts right. lining the street. Hmm. Since they got off the 17 right there at Camelback, I mean, the streets have been lined with people paying their final respects as the motorcade makes its way over to the North Phoenix Baptist Church. Look at that. All right, so starting with the welcome and the invocation by senior pastor Dr. No Garcia. There will be a hymn, Amazing Grace, that's performed by the Brophy Student Ensemble. And for those who don't know, two of John McCain's sons went to Brophy. There will also be a reading that will be by Bridget McCain. Following that, tribute by Grant Woods. It's a longtime friend of the senator. Another tribute by Tommy Espinoza. Another hymn, Expression of Love, it's performed by Jonah Little, Sun uh, Little Sunday. He's actually a Navajo flutist. Another that will be followed by the tribute by Larry Fitzgerald which if you guys remember back in 2016, Larry wrote quite the message to Senator John McCain. And John McCain, shortly after he was diagnosed with glioblastoma, actually visited the Arizona Cardinals and spoke not just with Larry, but a few of the notable players, as well as team president Michael Bidwill, who, when I was speaking to him in Dallas on Sunday, was telling tales about how John would sit up there and watch games with him, and he was not shy about giving his opinion. Marshall, as a sports fan, and this is something that's maybe just a tangential part of Senator McCain's legacy, but it's something he definitely loved, particularly his hometown teams. Um, do you have any particular sports stories that stand out that, that you know, John McCain was, was so invested in the Cardinals and the Coyotes and the Diamondbacks? Uh, uh, no, I never, I don't get out to the ball games much anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm an old coach. I started out my <laughs> career as a high school coach and uh, I love sports and, and uh, I, uh, but uh, I wish I'd have known, you know, that he was more interested. I, he and I always talked history. It was like Barry Goldwater. Sure. Barry and I never, all 20 years I introduced him at a uh, thing and we, we never, we never uh, talked politics one time. It was always about history. Barry loved history too. He was a part of the history, and uh, and it was the same with John. Uh, and he was, uh, we we were we were like-minded uh, in fascination with history and military history. Uh, I, next to Arizona history and Western history, I love military history. It's so interesting to see right now the procession, as you can see, so many people on both sides lining the streets. I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, producers back there in the booth, we are still on Camelback. Looks like they are still continuing to make their way over to the North Phoenix Baptist Church. Expected to arrive, they were moved on to Central. Central Avenue is where they're at right now. Expected to arrive in the next couple of minutes. So let's get through the end of the memorial service just uh, to wrap that up before um, you're witnessing it live here on 12 News. Mm -hmm. After Larry Fitzgerald gives his tribute, we're expecting a tribute from Vice President Joe Biden and then a reading from his son, Andrew McCain, the song Arizona performed by the Brophy Student Ensemble. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Brophy, um, actually, Senator McCain was heavily involved with Brophy, um, and, and that explains why they're there today. A message by Father Edward Reese, the hymn Going Home performed by Jay Smith on bagpipe, then a benediction and dismissal by senior pastor Dr. No Garcia, and the recessional My Way by Frank Sinatra. And at about 11.15, um, they'll expect it to, they're expected to wrap that memorial service up and then depart North Phoenix Baptist Church for Phoenix Sky Harbor International Airport where his remains will be taken to Washington, D.C., where he'll lie in state at the U.S. Capitol tomorrow and then be laid to rest on Sunday. Looks like they have, they're getting pretty close here. So right around 940 is when they were expected, a few minutes behind schedule. Cindy McCain, the family, and the hearse will arrive there at the North Phoenix Baptist Church. They'll be greeted by senior pastor Dr. No Garcia. Uh, he'll be meeting them upon the arrival and then escort them into the church. Upon arrival, an honor guard will meet the hearse and then stand watch. Ceremonial pallbearers will then head out to the hearse. They're going to line everyone up. Mrs. Cindy McCain and the family will proceed to the rear of the hearse to observe the casket removal. That will actually be done by the Armed Forces Body Bearer Team. Retrieve the casket and proceed into the church. Everything so planned out and with so much purpose. I think that's what's so incredible. Going over the pallbearers. 
I mean, that alone. In no particular order, th these are listed alphabetically here, but Richard Adkerson, who was a friend and the CEO and vice chairman of Freeport McMorrin uh, Incorporated, former chairman of the National World War II Museum. Uh, David Berry, a friend, vice president of Swift Transportation. Stephen Betts, another friend of Senator McCain, founder and president of Betts Real Estate Advisors and the retired CEO of Suncor Development Company. Uh, we can go down the list. Shane Doan, we mentioned. Luis Gonzalez, uh, former um, notable Arizona athletes. Um, Don Brandt, a uh, friend and chairman of the board, president and CEO of Pinnacle West and Arizona Public Service. Dr. Ollie, uh, Oliver Harper, we actually had him on our show over the geez, past couple of days of coverage. He's a friend and a neighbor, a very good friend who talked extensively of his time with Senator McCain and the fun that they had together. You can see every single person who is part of this ceremony today just means so much to Senator McCain. We were talking yesterday about the thousands of staffers that he's accumulated over the course of his political career. Charles Black, friend and chairman of the Prime Policy Group and the strategist for the McCain for President campaign in 2008, also one of the pallbearers today. Uh, Josh Harper, friend and neighbor, the Honorable, um, I, I'm, forgive me for the last name, um, Diane Humatua, a uh, friend, U.S. District Court Judge for the District of Arizona. Um, the list goes on and on. Um, this is a, a pretty well laid out memorial service as we've spoken to a few times. It looks like the motorcade is slowing down as they approach the church. You've got to see at least a dozen motorcycles at the front of the motorcade there and a huge crowd of people assembled to pay their final respects to the senator. Yeah, I, I know we have uh, anchor Mark Curtis who is out there live right now. I'm wondering if we can send things over to him and kind of get an idea of what things are looking like from his perspective. We'll see if we can get Mark on the horn in just a minute here. Mark, are you there? Yes. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Okay, um, I can hear the helicopters overhead as we wait here outside the Phoenix Baptist Church, and um, that helicopter can only signal that the Senator's hearse is close as the journey comes close to an end. Uh, it's not quite over yet, but this soldier, this brave and valiant man that fought for our country and then fought for the right thing in the halls of Congress for so long is almost home. Uh, he will come here for a beautiful service this morning, but it'll only be a short layover. And then from there, the Senator will make his way to Washington for the final time. And guys, think for a second, how many times Senator McCain, who loved Arizona, came home as often as he could, made that flight from Phoenix to Washington. Later on today, he'll make that flight to Washington for the final time. And uh, I wanna just take some shots behind us because we understand that the hearse is now pulling up. Uh, I can see the motorcade pulling up that is leading the hearse with the Senator's body. Later on tonight, John McCain's body will rest in the rotunda at the US Capitol, whose halls he roamed and roared in for so long. A man who believed in compromise and that democracy has to have collaboration to thrive. As Republicans in 2018 moved further to the right and Democrats further to the left, McCain believed civility, compromise, and respect for the center was vital for our country moving forward. The beginning now of this brief layover for the senator before he makes his way to Washington and all of the purses and limos carrying Senator McCain's body, Senator McCain's body here, the North Phoenix Baptist Church now rolling up behind us. And it is a somber, emotional feeling for all of us that knew the Senator and covered him for so long to believe that this voice, this great voice of America, a man who fought for the voiceless, has left us. And this man can rest easy, guys, knowing that his legacy is intact. A legacy of honor, valor, integrity, compromise, and respect. And there we see Cindy McCain, the late senator's wife, with one of her sons, 
and the rest of the McCain children and family being greeted by well-wishers as they make their way from the limo into the church for what is sure to be a gut-wrenching but at the same time uplifting day. This was a very spiritual family and for so long they had actually you have to go back to April and sources now tell us that as early as April Senator McCain started making calls to the people that he wanted involved in this service today calls to people that he wanted to be his pallbearers and about a half hour ago while we were in studio with Emma and Paul and Marshall Trimble who added so much to our coverage this morning uh, the pallbearers were out here practicing and I saw Shane Doan, the great Coyotes captain for so long, and I saw Luis Gonzalez and, and so many others. Uh, as we all know, guys, the senator was a huge sports fan, loved the Diamondbacks, loved the Coyotes, loved the Cardinals. And as Emma mentioned earlier, Larry Fitzgerald said one of the most daunting and humbling things that he's ever been granted was the honor to speak at McCain's funeral today. And we'll hear that and we'll bring it to you all live here on 12. You can see the honor guard now assembled, waiting to take possession of the senator's casket, where it will be brought into the sanctuary and where services will begin. On a personal level, I, I always took, took it for granted that the senator would be here forever. Obviously, I knew the reality that he would pass on from this dreadful, terrible disease, this brain cancer that he fought for 13 months. But his presence was so large, he was one of those larger-than-life figures that to know that his body is gone is very tough. I can't help but think back this morning Someone asked me earlier, what did, you, what did you personally, as a reporter, admire most about John McCain? And, and I guess my answer is, I was envious of so many of his qualities that I don't have. Uh, his bravery under fire. We all like to believe that if the chips were down, we could be brave and upstanding and, and loyal to a fault. But most of us, and I thank God for it, would never be put to that test. The test that John McCain was when he was shot down over Vietnam at the height of the war and captured by evil people that meant to interrogate him and tortured him for five and a half years. And that he also had the guts when he was offered an early release to say, no, there are people here who have been here longer than me and I'm not going home until all of my comrades do people that forever were linked to John McCain and forever indebted to him for his bravery and service. The North Vietnamese captors knew what a prize they had in John McCain. They tried so often to break him and to manipulate him and to use him for propaganda. But in the end, and John McCain talked about this in his book, that you, owe, you, you always want to be the person that, that never breaks and that he, like he did on so many other occasions in his life going forward, admitted that they did eventually break him. As you look at so many of the sports figures and notables that will be here as his pallbearers in just moments, Kurt Warner, the great, great quarterback for the Cardinals who took them to the Super Bowl, right next to him, Luis Gonzalez. Opposite them, and I don't know if we can get a shot of Shane Doan, the Coyotes captain, for so many years. A who's who of Arizona dignitaries and a reflection of who John McCain was in his life. Politician, statesman, sports fan extraordinaire. A man who loved life, loved his family, who gave and received love in, in equal portions. Was beloved by his colleagues, feared by his enemies, but a man who, while he had a large bark, was always fair. He would fight for sure for the things that he thought were important. And he loved a good fight. He loved a good fight. But if he was wrong, if he was out of line, 
Demas spoke, he was always very quick, whether it was a, with a politician or a member of the media, to come up afterwards and say, hey, I was wrong, I overstated it, I shouldn't have said it that way, we're good, and to stick out his hand. And it was all settled at that point. As Marshall Trimble mentioned earlier this morning, the senator was a tenacious wrestler at the Naval Academy, and he was also a boxer. And, and I think that that fighting spirit is what carried him through life, both as a, a military member, a fighter jockey, a prisoner of war, and a feared but respected politician. A man who failed twice in his bid for the White House, but never gave up. That dogged determination, I think, helped define the man that John McCain was, and it's one of the reasons that he is so revered and so missed here on this Thursday morning as he begins his long journey home to Washington. And now you can see Cindy McCain accompanied by her sons and family coming out where his body will now be taken out of the hearse and brought into the church for this service this morning. Again, you're watching live coverage here on 12 News. We appreciate your joining us this morning as the McCains in Arizona and the rest of the country say goodbye to this great man. And sadly, it should be pointed out that McCain is survived by his mother. And oftentimes, and every parent that's watching this morning knows this, no parent should ever have to bury their child. But his mother, who's 106, I believe, will have to bury her son, John. And now you see the purse being opened and the body will be pulled out. And those pallbearers who have the honor of carrying his body into the church, all of them very somber, all of them had special and unique relationships with the senator, will have that great honor as the honor guard now makes its way out onto the curb and onto the street where the body will be taken from the hearse. Let's watch. All branches of the military represented in this honor guard. And years from now, all of these men involved here will have an incredible story to tell. That they had the great honor of helping to bring the senator home to his resting place here in Phoenix before the body makes its home, way home to Washington. We can just see our first glimpse of the flag-draped coffin of Senator John McCain. John Sidney McCain has been well chronicled. Born into Navy royalty, the son of an admiral, the grandson of an admiral, a man whose career path in the military was destined from day one that he would go into the Navy, where he became a fighter pilot. And then we were lucky enough here in Arizona have him decide to come here and make Arizona his home. First as a congressman, and then for over three decades as a senator. The 
honor guard now taking his body into the church. The pallbearers outside lined up. And the service, which we will broadcast shortly here on 12, will begin as soon as the senator's body is brought in. I will tell you on a personal level, my heart breaks for, for Cindy McCain and all of her kids today. She has been so strong through this whole thing. Guys, what you can't see out here, uh, there are people lined up holding old McCain campaign signs, people that didn't have seats. About a thousand seats were reserved for the public. They went quickly. Uh, but they're lined up here nonetheless to pay their respects. One of the things that I'll be watching for today is former Vice President Joe Biden, who had a very, very strong relationship with the Senator even though they were from opposite sides of the aisle. And one of the binding ties between them, former Vice President Biden lost his son in the same form of brain cancer that eventually took the life of Senator McCain. And through his final days, former Vice President Biden was a strong friend, not only to the Senator, but also to his family. And all of us in the 12 News family are humbled today to be able to bring you live coverage as we say goodbye to this great man. No matter what you believed politically, there is no doubting his legacy and the core and the spirit and the soul of who this man was. A man who always tried to do the right thing. Among the speakers today, as we mentioned, Vice President Joe Biden, cards receiver Larry Fitzgerald. We'll also hear from an Indian flautist, a senator very, very strong on Native American rights, and he was revered in the Native American community.
Right now, the casket containing the remains of Senator John McCain is being carried to the front of the church, his family, all seven of his children, as well as his widow, Cindy McCain. Standing behind that casket right now, thank Mark for his live reports outside of North Phoenix Baptist Church. This is the voice of Paul Gerke alongside Emma Jade here in the 12 News Studios. If you're just joining us, the memorial service at North Phoenix Baptist Church for Senator John McCain expected to begin just moments from now. It'll begin with a prelude and a processional, followed by a welcome and invocation by senior pastor, Dr. No Garcia. The people bringing him in, the Armed Forces Body Bearer Team, they retrieved the casket, all branches of the military represented in that honor guard. Let's listen in now. You may be seated. On behalf of the McCain family, thank you all so much for being here this morning as we remember and celebrate the life of Senator John McCain, a true American hero, a man loved by this church, a man loved by this nation in this city, a man of courage, a man of faith, and a man who dearly loved his family. As we celebrate and get into the service, I want to offer you a word of Scripture from the Word of God that will bring us comfort. It comes from the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 14. The Word of God says this, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. What a word of promise, hope, and comfort from the word of God. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, the creator and maker of all things, there is nothing new under the sun for you, Father. You know all things before they happen. And this morning, Lord, we pray for the friends and family of Senator McCain. And we will grieve, we will mourn, Father. But we will do so with a different hope because of the faith he has placed in Jesus Christ. That we can with confidence grieve with the hope to know that this very moment he is spending eternity with Jesus Christ, his Lord and Savior. What a comfort. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah. 
Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up the which is planted. I was 28 years old, and um, I'd only been a public defender as a few years out of law school. And for some reason, John McCain asked me to be his chief of staff when he got elected. So on my first day at 7 a.m., John McCain picked me up at my house. I went to the car, and I said, well, do you want me to drive? He goes, no, no, I, I'm going to drive. So I said, well, maybe I can sit in the back seat. Uh, I'm no expert on this, but I thought the staff drove. He goes, no, get in the car, boy, get in the car. And for the next half hour, we just uh, talked about uh, the football games the day before and uh, whatever was in the news and politics and told a few jokes. And uh, it was, uh, at the same time, just really a lot of fun and also quite terrifying because of his ridiculously bad driving. Um, <laughs> So he'd get excited, he would kind of, you know, he drove like this anyway, and then he would get excited and just start drifting off, and like, hey, hello over there. <laughs> so we finally got where we were going, and I said, oh, hey, by the way, uh, what are we doing? And he goes, oh, uh, you know, I hired the whole staff, and I want you to meet him. I said, oh, okay, that's good. <laughs> so, um, so we met the staff, and then um, we went back uh, to the car. We got in the car, and all the staff came out, and they were all waving and things. And I said, well, they seem to be very nice. He goes, oh, you're going to have to fire half of them. <laughs> I said, what? what are you talking about? And he just sped off, and uh, the staff was waving. And uh, about one minute later, we went right back by, because he'd gone the wrong way, of course. <laughs> he waved again. And I just say that two hours kind of epitomized the next 35 years for me with John McCain. It was at once a little bit harrowing, a little wild, a little crazy, but um, a lot of fun and uh, the greatest honor of my life. I, I have people ask me all the time, did you ever know in those early years, did you have a feeling you had someone so special there? And uh, my answer is yeah, yes, absolutely. No question about it. And I'll tell you one, the, the first time, it was in December, and it was over in my hometown of um, uh, Mesa, Arizona. We were at a Rotary Club, and uh, I think it was all men at that time. And, you know, these are tough guys and kind of cynical about things, and here's this new guy in town. And one of them asked them, uh, since it was December, he asked them, what about Christmas in prison? And he told them a couple of, of uh, stories. 
He told him about one night when he was uh, uh, being interrogated for quite a long time and it didn't go too well uh, for his captors. They were upset with him. And so they tied him up and they tied the ropes tight and it was very painful and they left him there for the night. And uh, some guard came in who he did not know and never spoken to. And uh, at 10 p.m., the guard walked in and unloosened the ropes. And at about 4 a.m., the guard came back and tightened him up again so that he wouldn't get in trouble. And John didn't know why that happened, but he found out a little clue a couple weeks later, right before Christmas, when he was standing in the dirt yard and that guard just walked up next to him. And the guard didn't say a word, but with his sandal, He drew a cross in the dirt and they, they looked at it for a minute and then the guard rubbed it out and went on his way. And it was quiet in that room when John told that. And then he said, you know, on Christmas Eve we celebrated and we got together under this bare light bulb and we sang Christmas carols and we quoted Bible verses that we could remember, and we told the gospel story to each other. And I guess just that image of this band of brothers together in this God-forsaken place, singing to each other, and there at the front, our guy, John McCain, beaten up, but not down, singing his favorite Christmas carol. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. Round young virgin, mother and child, holy infant, so tender and mild. The words seem so far away from that place, but they leaned on the faith of their fathers and their faith in each other and their faith in their country and their faith in God. I looked out into that audience there in my hometown and those were some of my peers and the peers of my parents. Those are tough, independent guys. They're ranchers and farmers. There's some cowboys, businessmen, entrepreneurs, and they were crying. Because they saw in John McCain a little bit of what they hoped to see in themselves. They saw in John McCain the embodiment of values that they hoped to see for their country. Over the next few months and years, John got to know this place, and he fell in love with Arizona. He loved the people, our diversity, our Native American community, our Hispanic culture, and he loved the place, in particular, the Grand Canyon, the Colorado River. We floated down that twice together, and then he kept going back and back. He loved it. He hiked the canyon with, with Jack not that long ago, rim to rim. He loved Sedona. He loved this place. And if John McCain fell in love with Arizona, Arizona fell in love with John McCain. We ran a lot of races here, a lot of elections. He never lost, never really very close. Arizona loved him. We had one little blip one time when he ran for the Senate the first time. He called me on the phone. He goes, well, boy, I think I, I might have screwed up. I go, what? He said, well, you know, I was talking to these students at U of A, and they said, how come you're the only politician that comes down here? They only go to the retirement places. He said, well, it's because you guys don't vote. Okay? Those other dudes vote like 100%, you know? So you want people to come down here, you need to vote like they vote out at Seizure World. I said, y you didn't say that, did you? Because there's this big retirement community called Leisure World in the East Valley. 
and uh, they weren't real happy with their new nickname out there. <laughs> so John said, like he always does, he said, okay, I screwed up, let's go, we gotta go out there, we, and um, <laughs> so we went out, and I remember we drove in, and there was an, about a 90-year-old guy in a golf cart right there, and he was giving us the finger. <laughs> And uh, little did he know, we both said, that's great. We love that. <laughs> and John was like, hey, good to see you. Good to see you, pal. Thank you. Thank you. So he went in. He said, oh, sorry about that, and went, went to work. And guess what? I think he won that about 85-15 in that election, in that precinct. So we're, we're going to miss so many things about him here in our state his leadership here on these important issues. We're going to miss his sense of humor. We're going to miss his, his love of sports. He, he, he loved the teams, all of our teams. I mean, by love them, I mean love them, like nonstop, okay? And, um, and he loved you guys, Fitz and Gonzo and Shane. He really did. Not a coincidence. He didn't become friends just with the best players, but with the best people. And um, he loved you guys. But I think we also worry here in Arizona about a bigger picture. And I hope that what he stood for will um, maybe get a renewed uh, look in our country. That's what he would want. He would want us to, okay, we recognize him now, but now let's get to work. And I'm sure the Vice President will talk about John and bipartisanship, but he believes so much but this, in the end, when it's all said and done, this Republican Democrat thing's not that important, is it? We're all Americans, and you've got to get to the point where we can, we can work together as Americans. His support of the military, I hope you members of Congress will, will keep that strong. It was so important that he had their backs. And one other thing, John McCain believed in our Constitution, and he stood up for it. He fought for it every step of the way. So he would not stand by as people tried to trample the Constitution or the Bill of Rights, including the First Amendment. And you know what? He believed in the Declaration of Independence. When we proclaim to the world that every single human being is important, every single human being is precious, every single person in this world has the right to live free, not because the government says so, but because God gave us that right. So John McCain, his entire life, stood by the freedom fighters across the world. He was there. He was there figuratively and literally, by their side, wherever they were, acknowledging their right to live free. It's, it's a long and winding road that took him from that dirt yard in Hanoi to the dirt back roads of Hidden Valley. But through it all, he was resolute. He was courageous every step of the way. And in Arizona, he was our hero. I think you can see from this outpouring of support and love for John McCain that he was America's hero. Senator John McCain from Arizona. He served his country with honor. He fought the good fight. He finished the race. He kept the faith. Now, my friend, we can finish the song. Sleep in heavenly peace. Sleep in heavenly peace. Amen. Well, I, I had the great opportunity of meeting uh, Congressman 
John McCain in Washington. See, Hallett was back there and I was visiting and uh, he said, you, you need to meet this congressman, this young maverick, full of energy. And I said, oh yeah. He says, besides that, he's gonna become president of the United States one of these days, so you need to meet him. I said, okay. So we met in Virginia, in Arlen, uh, Ella, Ella, yeah, my apologies. It was rough getting up here. Uh, Alexandra, Cindy and CA and myself, and we had dinner in this nice little restaurant. And we chatted for a while, and then all of a sudden, with John McCain, you just bond. I mean, there's something about his energy level that goes up. He starts talking, starts asking me about my background. Of course, I, not knowing him that well, asked him about his. And before I knew it, we felt very comfortable with each other going back and forth. So then I got enough nerve to ask him. I said, Congressman, what, what was it that allowed you to be in a prisoner of war camp? I mean, what kept you together? And he said, well, he goes, you know, most people ask me how they treated me, and obviously they treated me pretty bad. He goes, but, he said, my, one is my faith in God, my love for my family, and my faith in my country. He said, those things kept me, kept me together. So we kept talking that evening, and as I thought about that, that discussion, and for this, this talk, I wanted to reflect with you a reading from Corinthians 13, which I think captures, captures uh, Senator John McCain. Corinthians 13. Though I should give away to the poor all that I possess, and even give up my body to be burned, if I am without love, it will do me no good, whatever. When you think about an individual like Senator McCain, who suffered, who was in prison, was injured, and yet with all that, was able to keep his faith together, his focus on his country, focus on his family, I believe that that period of time, those five years, is where God molded this fantastic hero, where God took an opportunity to humble this young man who came from a military family. God used those minutes, those hours, those days, those years to put together a human being that we'll be talking about the senator for generations. John McCain was a person who loved, with his energy, who loved all of us, who loved his country. That evening while we were having dinner, he said, when we get back to Phoenix, we need to get together and have dinner. And of course, back then I was pretty cocky. So I said, well, Congressman, I know a number of congressmen and I know a couple of senators and, you know, we always hear that. He says, well, no, when you get back, you give me a date and, uh, and I'll be there. I said, well, I'm going to invite you to my house. Us, us Mexican-Americans love to cook and we love to have folks at our homes if you're really going to be a friend. And he chuckled. So a couple of months later when I got back home, we called, set up a a dinner at the house, and of course I was preparing carne asada, frijolitos, arroz, tortillas, and all the stuff that you all know about, and my homemade salsa. And I get a call from his office, they say he's running late. So I ask, what's the problem? I said, well, it's his birthday. He wanted to spend a little bit of time with his family. <laughs> Sorry, Cindy. And of course, I panic and say, you know, if he wants to cancel, I, I understand, please. They said, no, he made it very clear to us. He's going to your house tonight to have dinner. 
So I scrambled and got a mariachi group. <laughs> I figured I got to do something really good. <laughs> Mexican food's not going to get me there. And luckily, they got there about 10 minutes before he arrived. <clears throat> so when Cindy and, and the congressman then walk into my house, the kitchen, the mariachi started playing. They sing in the Mañanitas, which is a traditional Mexican birthday song for, in our culture. And of, and of course, John and Cindy lit up, and it was a great evening, and we, we enjoyed, the, enjoyed the night. That's Senator John McCain. Keeps his word. That's the senator that we've had all these years that sometimes we beat up on. That's the senator that I hope people can embrace what he stood for, for our country. And yes, he was a maverick. In his first senatorial campaign, I get a call, and it's him on the phone. I'm with Father Tony, a dear friend of mine, and he's, they say, he's, he's, you got the congressman on the phone. I don't know how he tracked me down, but we're in a restaurant. So I get the phone and he says, Tommy, I'm running for the U.S. Senate. I'm going to launch, blah, blah, blah. You know, John, he was going 100 miles an hour. So I'm going like, okay. And then he says, I want you to co-chair my campaign. I said, well, uh, John, you know, I'm a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not sure that's going to help you with your Republican campaign. I said, I don't care. You're my friend. I want you to coach her. I said, well, let me sleep on it. No. No, no. You give me an answer right now, yes or no. And of course, I said yes. Once again, Senator John McCain he goes over to the other side. And don't forget, I was like an activist back then. I was running Chicanos for la Causa. I mean, we were not the most liberal organization or the most conservative organization in the country. And we go back and forth with, with, with John, you either were a friend or not. And at the end of the day, we could go a couple of years without seeing each other. But when we did, it was like old home week. I mean, he was warm. He was energy. I mean, he was going 100 miles an hour, but yet he made time to be with you. And then the second time, we get a call, Elvira and I, to come to Las Vegas, and this is, of course, when he's in his presidential campaign. And we, we end up in Las Vegas with his, his two right-hand folks that have always run his campaigns, which I have the greatest respect for. So we do the quick chit-chat, and then John says, uh, I, I want you to speak on my behalf at the Republican Convention. I said, uh, Senator, I want to remind you I'm a Democrat. <laughs> ah, I don't care. I want you there. So you're my friend. I want you there. I said, uh, yes, I'll, I'll be there. He said, well, he says, with a big smile on his face, watch out when you start your car. <laughs> I said, Okay, Senator, <laughs> I'll do that. So, John kind of put me out in the national scene. And, uh, and, and I must confess, he did a number of things that I could stand here all day and share with you different stories. I will tell you that that one time when we met is, is when Megan was on the TV program, and I don't even remember the name of the TV program, Megan, but he said, well, you know, Megan's on TV now, and blah, blah, blah. I go, yeah, okay. Do you see her? Uh, no, Senator, I don't watch TV that much. Well, you start watching her. <laughs> okay. So that was our, our great Senator. As we were walking out, he asked my, my wife, Elvira, he says, Vita, I got a question for you. If, if I put a woman on our, on our ticket as vice president, what do you think about that? Well, my wife isn't the type that holds back. She's a Mexican from Mexico City. 
and they have a tendency of just telling you how, how they it is, and of course, the senator liked that. So she turns and she says, well, I really don't care if it's a man or a woman. If something happens to you, I want to make sure that person can run the country. So John looked at her and says, okay, and he looked at his two guys, and of course, we walked out. Needless to say, we heard later who had selected. But again, regardless, there was the senator again taking the risk of putting forth a woman for vice president of this great country of ours. So it's of no surprise. It's of no surprise also that he got together with Kennedy to push for immigration reform. Because when he talked about immigration, it wasn't so much the politics of it. He would say, you know what, I can't believe these families that come from another country, from Mexico, from Central America to work, cutting our grass, feeding us, bringing in the labor force that we need, and now we turn on them? That really struck at the heart of what he thought our great country was about. I believe it cost him a presidential campaign. So to me, it's very dear what the senator is about. To me, John really did reflect our country in its true form. My father is a Marine, passed away in February. Once a Marine, always a Marine, he'd say. Got wounded in Guam, got a purple heart. When he talked about John McCain, he said he understands us. He understands us, and I must confess, he did understand us. He understood all of us, whether it was white, black, brown, Asian. To him, it didn't make any difference. What he knew is that we all make America great. We all make America great. So I hope that in his legacy, the senators, governors, mayors, city council members, elected officials embrace the thought of love because John reflected love and love of a strong man. And that is nowadays hard to come by. So his legacy will go on for generations because people will talk about Senator John McCain is one of the greatest heroes in our lifetime. And with that, if you permit me, read Timothy 2. As for me, my life is already being poured away as a libation, and the time has come for me to depart. I have fought the good fight, to the end. I have run the race to the finish. I have kept the faith. My dear friend, vaya con Dios. Gracias.
fell in love with my country when I was a prisoner in someone else's. Senator McCain spoke these heartfelt words as he accepted the Republican nomination for president in 2008. They were the words of an authentic American hero. We all know how the story goes. A fiery Navy pilot shot down by the North Vietnamese over a lake near Hanoi. As his plane spun out of control, he bailed out just in time to plunge into the lake below. That pilot, a young John McCain, was taken hostage as a prisoner of war, where he spent more than five and a half years, almost 2,000 days, he would endure countless beatings, torture, solitary confinement, and mental and emotional anguish that none of us will ever have to endure. After getting to know Senator McCain, I felt compelled to visit Vietnam. I wanted to see the places where the will of John McCain was tested and forged. I saw the lake. I walked the steps, I sat in the cell, and the ordeal that my friends survived became all the more real. Many people might wonder what a young African-American kid from Minnesota and a highly decorated Vietnam War hero turned United States Senator might have in common. Well, I, I, I thought of a few. I'm black, he was white. <laughs> I'm young. He wasn't so young. <laughs> he lived with physical limitations brought on by war. I'm a professional athlete. He ran for president. I run out of bounds. <laughs> he was the epitome of toughness, and I do everything I can to avoid contact. <laughs> I have flowing locks, and well, he didn't. How does this unlikely pair become friends? I've asked myself the same question. But do you know what the answer is? That's just who he is. Over the several years, I had the privilege of spending time with Senator McCain. Sometimes it was just a visit to our practices. Other times it was him texting and saying, oh, you need to pick it up this Sunday. <laughs> I'm thankful that through these moments, the opportunity that we had to share our lives, and more importantly, our stories. While from very different worlds, we developed a meaningful friendship. And this highlights the very rare and very special qualities of Senator McCain that I came to deeply admire. He didn't judge individuals based on the color of their skin, their gender, their backgrounds, their political affiliations, or their bank accounts. He evaluated them on the merits of their character and the contents of their hearts. He judged them on the work they put in and the principles they lived by. It was this approach to humanity that made Senator John McCain so respected by countless people around the world, including me. His accomplishments were many. U.S. Senator, presidential candidate, statesman, warrior, and hero. His work ethic, tireless. His fight, legendary. But what made Senator McCain so special was that he cared about the substance of my heart, more so than where I came from. While some might find our friendship out of the ordinary, it was a perfect example of what made him an iconic figure of American politics and service to fellow man. He celebrated differences. He embraced humanity, championed what was true and just, and saw people for who they were. Yes, ours was an unlikely friendship, but it's one that I will always cherish. I've had the honor of attending several of the Sedona forums hosted by Senator McCain and his remarkable wife, Cindy. There were world leaders in politics, business, science, and education to discuss the most pressing matters of our time. Issues like healthcare, global warming, technology, and human trafficking. These leaders gathered to find real solutions, and they gathered because Senator McCain asked them to be there. His devotion to making Arizona, the United States, and the whole world a better place for everyone has inspired countless leaders, like those at the Sedona Forums. I'm confident his legacy of devotion and to the common good will continue to inspire people around the world long after today. A few years ago, 
He was kind enough to take me on a personal tour of the U.S. Senate. It was obvious that Senator McCain was highly regarded. He believed to be right and was good regardless of which political side of the aisle his opinion fell on. I saw how respected he was and how much admiration he commanded from people from across the political spectrum. But that admiration wasn't surprising because Senator McCain was known as a man of integrity and conviction. A man who at times, just as he sacrificed himself for his fellow POWs in Vietnam, willingly chose to sacrifice his own political gains in order to accomplish what he believed was best for all. As, as a result of this type of fat sacrifice, he may have lost the support of a political ally here and there, but he gained the respect and admiration of an entire nation. In closing, I'd like to honor the love I saw in Senator McCain. He loved the people of Arizona, serving them passionately and diligently for decades. He took that same love to Washington and boldly advocated for the freedoms and liberties he had grown to love as a young Navy pilot. But the love I saw most was the love he had for his wife, Cindy, and his children. I heard him speak about them often, and the love always came pouring through in every word. Senator McCain, it's been a true honor to call you friend. Your toughness and bravery inspired us. Your sacrifice enriched our lives. Your devotion to the people of Arizona, our nation, and your convictions won our admiration. Your love set an example for all of us to follow. Jackie Robinson once said, a life is not important except in the impact that it has on other lives. Senator McCain, we will miss the blessings of being in your presence, but we will never forget the impact you had on the world and more importantly, on each of the lives that you touched. We are all better for having known you. Rest in peace, my friend. My name's Joe Biden. <laughs> I'm a Democrat. <laughs> and I love John McCain. I have had the uh, dubious honor over the years of giving some eulogies for fine women and men that I've admired. But, Lindsay, this one's hard. The three men who have spoken before me, I think, captured John, different aspects of John, in a way that only someone close to him could understand. But uh, the way uh, I look at it, the way I thought about it was that uh, I always thought of John as a brother. We had a hell of a lot of family fights. <laughs> we go back a long way. I was a young United States senator. I got elected when I was 29, and I was had the dubious distinction of being put on the Foreign Relations Committee, which uh, the next. Uh, youngest person was uh, 14 years older than me. And uh, um, I, uh, I spent a lot of time uh, traveling the world because I was assigned uh, a responsibility. My colleagues in the Senate know I was chairman of the European Affairs Subcommittee. So I spent a lot of time on NATO and then the Soviet Union. And. Uh, Along came a guy a couple years later, a guy I knew of, admired from afar, your husband, who had been a prisoner of war, who had endured enormous, enormous pain and suffering, and demonstrated uh, the code, the, uh, the um, McCain code. People don't think much about it today, but imagine having already known the pain 
you were likely to endure and being offered the opportunity to go home. But saying no, as the sun can tell you, the Navy, last one in, last one out. So I knew of John. And John became the Navy liaison officer in the United States Senate. There was an office uh, then, it used to be on the, the basement floor, of members of the military who are assigned to senators when they travel abroad to meet with heads of state or other foreign dignitaries. And uh, John had been recently released from Hanoi Hilton, a genuine hero, and uh, he became the Navy liaison. For some reason, we, uh, we hit it off from the beginning. Um, we were both full of dreams and ambitions and an overwhelming desire to make the time we had there um, worthwhile, to try to do the right thing, to think about how we could make things better for the country we love so much. And John and I ended up traveling. Um, every time I went anywhere, I took John with me, or John took me with him. And we were in China, Japan, Russia, Germany, France, England, Turkey, all over the world, tens of thousands of miles. And, uh, and we would sit on that plane and late in the night when everyone else was asleep and just talk, getting to know one another. We talk about family. We talk about politics. We talk about international relations. We talk about promise, the promise of America, because we're both cockeyed optimists and really believe that there's not a single thing beyond the capacity of this country. I mean, for real, not a single thing. And, uh, and when you get to know another woman or man, you get to know their hopes and their fears, you get to know their family even before you meet them. You get to know how they feel about really important things. We talked about everything except captivity and the loss of my family, which had just occurred, my wife and daughter. Only two things we didn't talk about. But I found that uh, it wasn't too long into John's duties that uh, Jill and I got married. And Jill is here with me today. Five years, I had been a single dad, and, uh, and no man deserves one great love, let alone two. And I met Jill, who changed my life, and, uh, and she fell in love with him and he with her. He'd always call her, as, as Lindsay later would travel with her, he'd call her Jilly. And, uh, and uh, matter of fact, uh, when they'd get bored uh, being with me on these trips. I remember going to see Carmen Lise in Greece. And he said, why don't I just take Jill to dinner? I later learned that they're down in a, a, uh, a cafe and a, on the, at the port, and he has her dancing on top of a cement table drinking ouzo. <laughs> Not a joke. Chili. Right, Chili? <laughs> So, uh, but um, we got to know each other well. And he loved my son, Bo, and my son, Hunt. As a young man, he came up to my house. He'd come up to, to Wilmington. And uh, out of this grew a great friendship that transcended whatever political differences we had or later developed. Because above all, above all, um, we understood the same thing. All politics is personal. It's all about trust. And I trusted John with my life, and I would. And I think he would trust me with his. We both knew then from our different experiences that, uh, and as our life progressed, we learned even more, that there are times when life can be so cruel, pain so blinding, it's hard to see anything else. The, the disease that took John's life, 
took our mutual friends, Teddy's life, the exact same disease nine years ago, a couple days ago. And three years ago, it took my beautiful son Bo's life. It's brutal. It's relentless. It's unforgiving. And it takes so much from those we love and from the families who love them that in order to survive, we have to remember how they lived, not how they died. I carry me with, with me an image of Bo sitting out in a little lake we live on, starting a motor on the little boat and smiling and waving. Not the last days. I'm sure Vicki Kennedy has her own image, maybe looking, seeing Teddy looking so alive on his sailboat out in the Cape. And for the family, for the family, you will all find your own images, whether it's remembering his smile or his laugh or a touch in the shoulder or just running his hand down your cheek. Or just feeling like someone's looking at and turning and see him just smiling at you from a distance, just looking at you. Or when you saw the sheer joy that crossed his face the moment he knew he was about to get up and take a stage in the center floor and start a fight. <laughs> God, he loved it. <laughs> so to Cindy and to the kids, Doug, Andy, Sydney, Megan, Jack, Jimmy, Bridget, and I know she's not here, but to Mrs. McCain, we know how difficult it is to bury a child, Mrs. McCain. My heart goes out to you. And I know right now the pain you all are feeling is uh, so sharp and so hollowing. And John's absence is all-consuming for all of you right now. It's like being sucked into a black hole inside your chest. And it's frightening. But I know something else, unfortunately, from experience. That there's nothing anyone can say or do to ease the pain right now. But I pray. I pray you take some comfort knowing that because you shared John with all of us, your whole life. The world now shares with you the ache of John's death. Look around this magnificent church. Look what you saw coming at the state capitol yesterday. It's hard to stand there. But part of it, part of it was, at least it was for me with Bo standing in the state capitol, you knew. It was genuine. It was deep. He touched so many lives. And I've gotten calls, not just because people knew we were friends, not just from people around the country, but leaders around the world calling me. Megan, I'm getting all these sympathy letters. I mean, hundreds of them and tweets. Character is destiny. John had character. While others will miss his leadership and his passion, even his stubbornness, you're going to miss that hand on your shoulder. The family, you're going to miss the man faithful man as he was, who you would know would literally not figuratively give his life for you. And for that, there's no bomb but time. Time in your memories of a life lived well and lived fully. But I make you a promise. I promise you. The time will come because what's going to happen is six months will go by and everybody's going to think, well, it's past. 
but you're going to ride by that field or smell that fragrance or see that flashing image. And you're going to feel like you did the day you got the news. But you know you're going to make it when the image of your dad, your husband, your friend, crosses your mind and a smile comes to your lip before a tear to your eye. That's when you know. And I promise you, I give you my word, I promise you, this I know. That day will come. That day will come. You know, uh, I'm sure as my former colleagues and all who work with John, I'm sure there's people who have said to you, not only now, but the last 10 years, explain this guy to me. <laughs> right? Explain this guy to me. Because as they looked at him, in one sense they admired him, but in one sense they, the way things have changed so much in America, they look at him as if John came from another age, that he lived by a different code, an ancient, antiquated code where honor, courage, character, integrity, duty, where it mattered, because that was obvious how John lived his life. But the truth is, John's code was ageless, is ageless. When you talked earlier, Grant, you talked about values. It wasn't about politics with John. He could disagree on substance, but it was the underlying values that animated everything John did, everything he was. You could come to a different conclusion. But were he part company with you, if you lack the basic values of decency, respect, knowing that this project is bigger than yourself. John's story is the American story. That's not hyperbole. It sounds like it's the American story, grounded in respect and decency, basic fairness, the intolerance for the abuse of power. Many of you have traveled the world Look how the rest of the world until recently looks at us. They look at us as a little naive. We're so fair. We're so decent. We're the naive Americans. But that's who we are. That's who John was. And he could not stand the abuse of power wherever he saw it, in whatever form in whatever country. It's always about basic values, John. Fairness, honesty, dignity, respect, giving hate no safe harbor, leaving no one behind, and understanding that as Americans, we're part of something much bigger than ourselves. With John, it was a value set that was neither selfish nor self-serving. John understood that America was, first and foremost, an idea, audacious and risky, organized around, not tribe, but around ideals. Think of how he approached every issue. The ideals that Americans have rallied around for over 200 years, the ideals that the world has repaired to, an idea enshrined in the Constitution sounds corny. We hold these truths self-evident, that all men are created equal, endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights. To John, those words had meaning, as they had for every great patriot that has ever served this country. We both love the Senate. Proudest years of my life for being a United States Senator. 
And I was honored to be vice president, but being a United States senator. And we both lamented watching it change. During long debates in the 80s and 90s, as some of the colleagues who were around then would know, I'd always go over and sit next to John, next to his seat. Or he'd come over on the Democratic side and sit next to me. No, I'm not joking. Because we'd sit there and we'd talk to each other. And I can remember the day when I came out to see John. We, we reminisced about it. It was in 96. And we were about to adjourn for what we call the caucuses. There's a luncheon once a week that all the Democratic senators have lunch together and all the Republican senators. And we both went into our caucus, and coincidentally, we were approached by our caucus leaders with the same thing. It was raised as a discussion. Joe, it doesn't look good you sit next to John all the time on there. <laughs> Swear to God. Same thing was said to John in your caucus. That's when things began to change for the worse in America, in the Senate. That's when it changed. What happened was, at those times, it was always appropriate to challenge another senator's judgment, but never appropriate to challenge their motive. When you challenge their motive, it's impossible to get to go. If I say you're doing this because you're being paid off, if I say you're doing this because you're not a good Christian, if I say you're doing this because you're this, that, or other thing, it's impossible to reach consensus. Think about it in your personal lives. But all we do today is attack the oppositions of both parties, their motives, not the substance of their argument. This is the mid-90s. Well, it began to go downhill from there. The last day John was on the Senate floor, what was he fighting to do? He was fighting to restore what we call regular order, to start to treat one another again like we used to. Scent was never perfect, John. You know that. We were there a long time together. But I'd watch Teddy Kennedy and James O. Eastland fight like hell on civil rights, and they'd go have lunch together down the Senate dining room. John wanted to see, quote, regular order writ large, get to know one another. You know, uh, John and I were both amused, and I think Lindsay was at one of these events, where John and I received two prestigious awards. Uh, um, the last year I was vice president, and then one immediately after, for our dignity and respect we showed to one another. We received an award for civility in public life. There's a college, Allegheny County puts, uh, College puts out this prestigious award every year for bipartisanship. And John and I look at each other and say, what in the hell's going on here? <laughs> no, not a joke. I say to Senator Flake, that's how it's always supposed to be. You're getting an award? No, I'm, not, I'm serious. Think about this. Getting an award for your civility getting an award for bipartisanship. And classic John, the one at Allegheny College, there were hundreds of people there, and we got the award. And John, the Senate was in session, and so he spoke first. And as he walked off the stage and I walked on, he uh, looked at me and said, Joe, don't take it personal, but I just don't want to hear what the hell you have to say. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and left. One of John's major campaign people was now with the Senate, with the governor of Ohio, was on this morning and happened, shaving, happened to watch it, and he said that uh, um, Biden and McCain had this strange relationship. They always seemed to have each other's back. 
Whenever I was in trouble, John was the first guy there. And I hope I was there for him. And we never hesitate to give each other advice. He'd call me in the middle of a campaign and say, what the hell did you say that for? <laughs> well, not an issue. Like, you just screwed up, Joe, you know? And I'd occasionally call him. Look, I've been thinking this week about why John's death has hit the country so hard. Yes, he was a long-serving senator with a remarkable record. Yes, he was a two-time presidential candidate to capture the support and imagination of the American people. And yes, John was a war hero who demonstrated extraordinary courage. I think of John, and I must say my son, when I think of Ingersoll's words, when the will defies fear, when duty throws the gauntlet down to fate, when honor scorns to compromise with death, that is heroism. Nobody knows that about John. But I don't think it fully explains why the country has been so taken by John's passing. I think it's something more intangible. I think it's because they knew John believed so deeply and so passionately in the soul of America that he made it easier for them to have confidence and faith in America. His faith in the core values of this nation made them somehow feel it more genuinely themselves. His conviction that we as a country would never walk away from the sacrifices generations of Americans have made to defend liberty and freedom and human dignity around the world it made average Americans proud of themselves and their country. His belief, and it was deep, that Americans can do anything, withstand anything, achieve anything, was both unflagging and ultimately reassuring if this man believed that so strongly. His capacity that we truly are the world's last best hope, that we're the beacon to the world, that there are principles and ideals greater than ourselves and worth suffering, sacrificing for, and if necessary, dying for. Americans saw how he lived his life that way, and they knew the truth of what he was saying. I just think he gave Americans confidence John was a hero. His character, courage, honor, integrity. But I think the thing that's under, understated the most is his optimism. That's what made John special. Made John a giant among all of us. But in my view, John didn't believe that America's future and fate rested on heroes. What we used to talk about, and I liked most about him, as he understood what I hope we all remember. Heroes didn't build this country. Ordinary people being given half a chance are capable of doing extraordinary things. Extraordinary things. John knew ordinary Americans understood that each of us has a duty to defend the integrity, dignity, and birthright of every child. They carry it. That good communities are built by thousands of small acts of decency that Americans, as I speak today, show each other every single day. That buried deep in the DNA of this nation's soul lies a flame that was lit over 200 years ago that each of us carries with us. And each one of us has the capacity, the responsibility, and we can screw up the courage to ensure that's not extinguished, and it's a thousand little things that make us different. The bottom line was, I think John believed in us. I think he believed in the American people. Not just all the preambles, the Constitution. He believed in the American people. All 325 million of us. 
Even though John is no longer with us, he left us pretty clear instructions. Quote, believe always in the promise and greatness of America, because nothing is inevitable here. Close to the last thing John said to the whole nation, as he knew he was about to depart. That's what he wanted America to understand. Not to build his legacy, he wanted America to remind them to understand. I think John's legacy is going to continue to inspire and challenge generations of leaders as they step forward. And John McCain's impact on America is not over. It's not hyperbole. It is not over. I don't think it's even close. Cindy, John owed so much of what he was to you. You were his ballast. When I, when I was ever with you both, I could just see how he looked at you. Jill's the one when we were in Hawaii and he first met you there, he, he, he kept staring at you and Jill finally said, go up and talk to her. <laughs> and Doug and Andy, Sydney, Megan, Jack, Jimmy, Bridget, you may not have had your father as long as you would have liked, but you got from him everything you need to pursue your own dreams, to follow the course of your own spirit. You are a living legacy, not hyperbole. You're a living legacy and proof of John McCain's success. Now John's going to take his rightful place in a long line of extraordinary leaders in this nation's history who in their time and in their way stood for freedom and stood for liberty and have made the American story the most improbable and the most hopeful and the most enduring story on earth. I know John said he hoped he played a small part in that story. John, you did much more than that, my friend. To paraphrase Shakespeare, we shall not see his like again. The second reading is from Second Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. the lifeblood of me. 
dust in the wind. The sage and cactus bloom in, and the smell of the rain on your skin. Ooh, 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 Arizona, you're the magic in me. Ooh, ooh, Arizona, you're the life. Jesus at the uh, final meal he shared with his friends charged them, remember me. Remember me in the breaking of the bread. Bread has to be broken to be shared. We are celebrating today the life of a man who unselfishly was broken that we might be one again. John McCain, our brother, Jesus' brother. To remember, to bring together John McCain, I invite you to share the words of Henry Scott Holland. Laugh as we always laughed at jokes we enjoyed together. Play, smile, think of me, pray for me. Let my name be ever that household word that it always was. Let it be spoken without effect, without a trace of shadow on it. We pray. Lord God, may John McCain's vision be in our eyes, his voice in our words and our tongue, his listening to the needs of others in our ears, his love for his country in our hearts. Bless you, John McCain, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
As we come to a close, I'd like to read some words that were beautifully written by his daughter, Megan. My father is gone, and I miss him as only an adoring daughter can. But in this loss and in this sorrow, I take comfort in this. John McCain, hero of the Republic, and to his little girl, wakes today to something more glorious than anything on this earth. Today, the warrior enters his true and eternal life, greeted by those who have gone before him. And she writes, rising to meet the author of all things. We will grieve, well, we, we will mourn, but I want you to think about her words. In this very moment, Senator John McCain is in heaven with God the Father and Jesus the Son. No more cancer, no more pain, no more sickness, no more burdens of this world. In fact, his biggest concern is, is probably what channel do I have to find in heaven in order to watch Larry play on Sundays? <laughs> All joking aside, he's a free man and he's more alive than he's ever been. See, Senator McCain professed Christianity. And here's the hope in what Senator McCain believed. He knew Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He knew Romans 6.23, that the wages of sin was death, but the gift of God was eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ. So the hope that we have is the good news that Senator John McCain believed this passage from John 3.16. That for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that who believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. When we grieve and when we mourn, understand that he has eternal life and he is with the Father in heaven because of his faith in Jesus Christ. That is something to find comfort in. That is the reason why Megan can write these words so beautifully. Let us pray together. Father, as we leave from this place, we ask you to give comfort to Cindy and the family. As Vice President Joe Biden said, there will be days that the freshness of this lostness hits them hard, Father. And in those moments, Lord, when they find themselves by themselves mourning this deep pain and sorrow, will you comfort them, God? Will you give them the strength they need to walk every single day? And God, as we mourn, as your scripture says, we mourn differently with those that have hope because Senator John McCain believed that you sent your only son to walk this earth and live a sinless life, to die on the cross for our sins, for the things that we deserved. And he believed that Jesus Christ was put in the tomb and he rose again and he defeated death. That is a reason to celebrate and that is a reason for us to have comfort. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to thank you all again on the behalf of the McCain family for being here and supporting them. At this moment, we're going to ask you to stay seated until the family, the entire family, has exited the building.
Back live here at the North Phoenix Baptist Church, it shouldn't be lost on any of us as you look at the pallbearers waiting to receive Senator McCain's body. But the Senator chose the song, My Way, to close out the service. He lived those lyrics. It was a beautiful but gut-wrenching service this morning. And I really loved what former Vice President Joe Biden said. He said, John believed in us. He believed in the American people our resilience, our determination, and that in the end, we're more alike than different and that we can overcome anything. And now this man who endured so much and experienced so much heads to Washington and eventually Annapolis and his final resting place. Followed by his casket, John's wife, Cindy, his sons, daughters, seven children in all from two marriages. Seven children that he loved and adored and who loved him and adored him right back. It's been said maybe too often, but it bears repeating. It was a life well lived, John McCain. Here's the Vice President, former Vice President Joe Biden and his wife, Dr. Joe Biden, flanked by former Arizona Attorney General Grant Woods, who really gave a beautiful and stirring speech. Grant Woods, one of his best friends, ran his campaigns for him. Tommy Espinoza, the Latino leader who also spoke today so eloquently. And what an honor for these men, 
who will one day tell the story to their grandchildren that they had the great honor of being the guard that carried the senator's body to the hearse that from here will take him to Sky Harbor where he will fly to Washington for the final time. A flight he made many times, but this will be the last one. And then from Washington, where he'll lie in state in the rotunda tomorrow, a funeral at the National Cathedral on Saturday, and then on to Annapolis, where bucking family tradition, instead of being buried in Arlington National Cemetery, where his father and grandfather are buried, he chose to be buried instead next to his best friend from the Naval Academy, Admiral Chuck Larson. I don't know how you put into words what all of us are feeling today as we say goodbye to a hero. But that's what he was. He was a hero in every sense of the word. A man who endured more than any of us should have to endure in our lifetime. Captivity. Cancer. But John said he wouldn't trade a minute of everything that he experienced. Because in some ways, in many ways, it helped shape the man that he would become. And as Joe Biden said, he'll now take his place in the hall of great leaders who have formed and shaped and led this country. family is now in their limousine and they will follow the hearse as it leaves the church and slowly heads towards Sky Harbor. I still can see Cindy McCain. Final hug there for Grant Woods, his longtime confidant and friend. And you have to admire Cindy McCain's strength through all of this. She has been an absolute rock. And now she heads for the limousine. On this history, but historic, but heartbreaking day for all of us here in Arizona, a day we knew was coming, but a day we dreaded, and a day that is now here. John McCain, midshipman, Navy combat pilot, war hero, prisoner of war, congressman, senator, father, son, and husband. Of course, our hearts go out to the entire family, but most especially to his mother, who will have to bury a child. the hearse and the entire funeral procession will be guided by DPS troopers. As they make their way to the airport, we'll have it all for you right here on 12. Emma and Paul are standing by. They'll give you coverage as soon as they leave here.
as Arizona gives a great send-off to a great man. And it, I don't know if we can get a shot of this, but all of the people that were inside the service have now gathered on the curb to watch and say goodbye. Many with tears in their eyes, some will salute, all with their private thoughts of what this man meant to them and what he meant to our country as the procession takes off. And that'll be something to watch for. And now the hearse pulls away and the procession begins. As this war hero begins his journey home. John McCain, a common man who became uncommon in his valor, his integrity, his grit, his grace, ascended to the highest pedestals of Washington politics, but never got to the White House, but his voice was always strong and clear, and he never backed down on his beliefs or his values or what he believed. The senator said in his book, goodbyes are impossible. We've been too close for too long to part company now. But say goodbye we must. We'll now toss it back to the studio and pick up our coverage as the procession makes its way to the airport and check back in with Emma and Paul. Guys. Thank you very much, Mark. The diversity of those who spoke at Senator McCain's memorial speaks volumes about the man that he was. But I'm not sure there was a quote that struck me harder than Grant Woods, the former attorney general, echoing some of Mark's sentiment from earlier when he said he saw in John McCain a little of what people had hoped to see in themselves and in their country. John was just as much to his constituents as he was to the men and women he sat next to in Washington. The people, the little people, those that could do nothing for him, loved John just as much, and he loved them just as much. And, and I think that says so much about a man who dedicated six decades of his life to serving other people. And to serving our state right here in Arizona. I think it was evident the feeling of just how lucky we all are to be part of history because this name, John McCain, will go down in history. There's no doubt about that. You're taking a live look from Sky 12. I'm sorry our shot is not the best at the moment as we are following this procession on its way, excuse me, recession on its way to the airport. So let's give you the logistics on what exactly is going to happen from here. His body will now be taken to Sky Harbor where he will say goodbye to Arizona for the last time, which is a little hard to come to grips with. Uh, Vice President, former Vice President Joe Biden said something that I thought was so beautiful. He said that nothing anyone can say or do right now can take away the pain that everyone is feeling, speaking to the family. But just take comfort knowing because you share John with all of us your whole life, the world now shares with you the ache of his death. I know he was speaking to his children and to Cindy, but I couldn't help but think he was speaking a little bit to everyone in Arizona because there is an ache and there is almost a void there. Even hearing from all of these people, it, it makes you realize 
this man's shoes are going to be so hard to fill in the Senate. We're being joined now by Marshall Trimble, Arizona State historian who's been with us this morning. Thank you so much. We heard you gave up your seat there at, at North Carolina <laughs> Baptist Church My goodness. to be here for us and for yes. our viewers and for that we're very appreciative. I what thought it could be better service this here. <laughs> oh, so we, kind We of were you. all very emotional um, during that memorial service. Marshall, I, I'm curious though to get your, your takeaway. What, what did you think was most impactful about what we just witnessed? I was touched by the, the speakers uh, here. Joe Biden was especially uh, just, uh, and, and Grant Woods, uh, I've known Grant for a long time. You and, served with him, right? Yes, eight years. Eight years. Uh, uh, when he was Attorney General, I was on the Peace Officer Memorial Board, still am. And um, so I, I was, I, 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 I'm just, I'm overwhelmed emotionally. <laughs> You're looking right now at people lined up at 16th and Bethany Home Road as the recession heads to Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport. They'll stop at the 161st Air Refueling Wing, which is a unit of the Arizona Air National Guard, um, before they take off. Their scheduled departure is around 1235, but that may be pushed back just a little bit considering the length of the memorial today. Mm -hmm. They will land in Joint Base Andrews. We actually have our political insider, Bram Resnick, who is there right now in Washington, D.C. We're going to check in with him in just a little bit to get more details on what they're expecting over the next couple of days in Washington. We know that tomorrow, Friday, uh, Senator John McCain's body will lie in state at the U.S. Capitol. Such an honor. Saturday, the memorial service at the National Cathedral will take place. That is when you can expect to hear from former President Barack Obama, former President George W. Bush. And then on Sunday, a private burial happening at Annapolis, Maryland. You know, I think that says a lot. He had the opportunity, of course, to be buried at Arlington National Cemetery with his father, his grandfather, but instead chose to go back to where his career, his life all started and to be buried next to his best friend, Admiral Chuck Larson. You know, he cherished his friends. You saw that with Grant Wood. You saw that with Joe Biden. I mean, that didn't sound like a friend. That sounded like a brother. I thought that Biden was not the politician Joe Biden that we've come to expect of him. Mm -hmm. He looked shaken yeah. to start his remarks in, in his tribute. And you saw a little bit of the politician Joe Biden come out in stretches where he sort of commanded the attention of the room. But he had a hard time getting it going. And, and, and I thought the words he chose to start were perfect. My name is Joe Biden. I'm a Democrat, yeah. and I love John McCain. <laughs> oh, simple uh, Tommy, language. Uh, Tommy Espinosa did that too. <laughs> when you go back to their stories of their time, you know, in the Senate, and talking about how Joe would sit next to John, and John would sit next to Joe, I loved that. I loved hearing that. I loved hearing those stories of the good old days and how it used to be. And then, you know. Joe kind of talked about how things are different now and mm -hmm. the change that they're seeing and almost challenging the rest of America to not be part of that, to, to go back to how things were, to crossing the aisle. I felt inspired by his words, and I hope other people are taking that away too, that, that we need to carry on John McCain's legacy of not focusing on who people were, but focusing on the content of their heart. Larry Fitzgerald, one of his quotes, I mean, he had so many good ones. He said he didn't judge individuals based on the color of their skin, their gender, their backgrounds, their political affiliations, or their bank accounts. He evaluated them on the merits of their character and the content of their hearts. He said his love set an example, you know? And that, and that, and not all the work that, that Senator McCain has done, because right. I think that gets underscored in all of this. I mean, this Absolutely. is a man that accomplished a great deal yeah. over the course of his life professionally. It, it's his love that leaves a lasting legacy, and I think that's why you see someone step up and, and with an alternate, an alternate party affiliation, say, you know, I, I loved this man. Uh, Marshall, do you expect, knowing what you know about the history of our state, for that message to resonate here, do, do you think that at least temporarily, we can get back to civility in politics? I hope so. God, I pray we do. Yeah. <laughs> it's um, uh, civility is, is the word. And this is a good time for us to all reflect on that. Uh, everybody out there uh, should be reflecting on that very word right now because it, it, I've, we've all sensed it since, as uh, Joe Biden said, it, right. it, it came in the mid 1990s, this acrimonious this acrimonious situation where it's us against them. Uh, we're the U.S. That's us. <laughs> right. 
Uh, what, if anything, would you have added? What, what, what would you want people to know about the late senator? Well, we've said so many things about him and uh, described him uh, in such a way that uh, uh, we'll never forget him. Yeah. This is a land of giants. Arizona is a land of giants. It's a land of mavericks. And uh, right now, I think he stands taller than any of them. I think you're right. John, uh, John Biden put it, or Joe Biden, rather, excuse me. Uh, he said that all politics is personal. It's about trust. And he trusted John with his life. Yeah. <laughs> that was so profound to me. It, it, I can't imagine that there are people in the Senate right now on opposite sides of the aisle that would say that about one another. Well, there were a lot of them in the audience today, and I hope That's they true. took this, these words to heart. There were a lot of them in the audience, and you saw Joe Biden talk to them directly, yes. especially when he was referring to civility in politics. Right. You, t you saw him turn his body. Look right at him, yeah. Yes, looked right <laughs> at them straight in the eye and challenged them to be more like John McCain. You know, there was um, a time in Tommy Espinoza's talk that I thought was really poignant because a lot of people look back and they, they, talk, to, they talk about him, um, Senator John McCain's time as a POW. And he said when he first met Senator McCain, he asked him the question, how did you get through it? And the three things that Senator McCain responded with, I think are so beautiful, faith in God, love of family, and faith in country. Three. And I thought that was so, what a great way to live your life, to get yeah. through something so incredibly difficult. You're watching live right now as the motorcade is on I-17 on its way to Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport containing the casket of uh, Senator John McCain as he heads off to Washington, D.C. to lie in the rotunda of the National Capitol and say his final farewells um, tomorrow and Saturday. Departure scheduled for around 1235. He's leaving out of Terminal 3 of Phoenix Sky Harbor, which you may recall the Phoenix City Council recently voted to rename the John S. McCain That's the third right. terminal. They're talking about renaming the Senate building after John McCain as well. Uh, what yes. are your thoughts on that, Marshall? That's the Russell building, and I think it's, that's appropriate. I, 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 think, I think it's really John McCain's building. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm glad to see that. I'm glad to see it. He'll be placed on board a C-32 military aircraft um, escorted by the Armed Forces body bearers and depart from Arizona here shortly. Um, is there anything else that stood out to you, Marshall, about the tributes that we just witnessed, and we had kind of spoken about this before the ceremony began, that there was such diversity, not just in those who paid tribute. You're talking about a former attorney general, uh, uh, a Latino activist, uh, right. you know, Vice President Biden, a professional athlete and Larry Fitzgerald, but, but the Navajo flutist and, you know, the bagpipist, and, and to end it with Sinatra, it was as eclectic of a set of people that you could assemble to say goodbye to a man from who, who, who died in Cornville, Arizona. Yeah, to an eclectic man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. His whole career, his whole life has been eclectic. And, uh, he's, he's, he was born a maverick, I believe. Yeah, I think he so lived too. It. He yeah. lived it all the way to the end. You know, it's interesting to see how eclectic this memorial service was because I think that's another message that a lot of the speakers wanted to get across. It didn't matter who you were, it didn't matter where you came from, what your background was. He loved you no matter what. He, I, I like uh, what Tommy Espinoza said when you would talk to him. He made you feel like you were like basically the only person in the room. He would really look at you and really talk mm -hmm. to you. He said that he, uh, we, uh, he made America great. He made everything about America great. He understood all of us. I love how uh, the times when he would, he would ask Tommy if, if he would be part of his campaign and Tommy would constantly, <laughs> I, I'm a Democrat, <laughs> I'm a Democrat. And it wouldn't matter to him because no. he knew the contents yeah. of Tommy's heart. Yeah. You know, we've talked a lot about John McCain's 2008 days spent as a prisoner of war at the Hanoi Hilton, as it's been called. One thing I don't think we've touched on a whole lot is how much John suffered, not just as a prisoner of war, but throughout his entire life, mm -hmm. the injuries he suffered when he went down over Vietnam he couldn't lift his arms above his head, Marshall, for, for the rest of his life after that. Yeah. This is a man who was probably in pain every single day. And to consider, I never heard John McCain complain about never, the pain that he never. was in. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think that you ever would have. That's a guy who suffered in silence for the betterment of those around him. What does that say about his character? Well, there's, there's a courage. It, it's in his genes, too. I mean, he's had a grandfather and a father were it's admirals. It's that military discipline. And that discipline that... Both that, four-star uh, admirals in Arlington. Yeah. Uh, Annapolis Naval Academy. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that never leaves you. It never leaves you. Mm -hmm. 
And sometimes I think the further you're away from it, uh, my son with West Point was that way. The, the, the longer he's been away from the academy, uh, the, the more love he has for the place. And, uh, and he, they just live that, there's a code they live there and they're, they're a breed, they're a breed. And when you go, when you visit one of the academies, you come away thinking uh, America's in good hands. These are strong, strong people. These young men and women uh, are the future and they are gonna be the leaders and, and this, is, this, is where they're, this, is, this is where they get their training, I guess. I thought Joe Biden put it pretty well when he said John McCain was a hero, but America's fate does not rest in heroes. Good communities built by thousands of acts of decency. If there's one thing that I hope our viewers take away from our coverage today, it's that statement by Biden, yes. that, that good communities are built by thousands of acts of decency, that one man with six terms in the Senate can only do so much to make our world a better place, that it starts with each and every one of us. And I don't think that that's corny. I, I think that there's some real inspiration to be wrung out of that statement. I think so too, especially when you look at the time that he spent and the service that he gave to Arizona. It doesn't leave just because he has passed. There's things that we can still do to continue on with that legacy and that quote right there puts it in our hands to continue it and to keep his legacy going. What are some things that you think you will, you will write about when it comes to Senator John McCain that you will put in the history books over this? I've written about him ever since. Yeah. <laughs> in several books, but uh, I, uh, I, I've got so much more to say now, I think, uh, just uh, the, of the greatness. And, and it, we, we sometimes, it's fame is fleeting, but it won't be with him. His, yeah. his legacy will live on in this. Uh, uh, like other giants in Arizona, Carl Hayden and Ernest McFarlane and, and Barry Goldwater. Well, well, John, those are giants and John McCain's right up there with him now. You've been saving a funny story with Senator Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we would love to hear it. We would love oh, to hear it. By the way, somebody asked me the other day, he said, uh, if we had a Mount Rushmore in Arizona, uh, who should be on it? And I oh. said, uh, I said, okay, we start with Carl Hayden, okay. Ernest W. McFarlane, Barry Goldwater, and John McCain. They, those are the four, if we ever have a Mount Rushmore here. <laughs> Someone get to work carving that. Yeah, in the where, where are we going to put that? <laughs> well, I've already proposed that they have a statue uh, down at Wesley Boland Plaza to John McCain. Mm -hmm. We really need, because that's where school children go, and right. uh, and I see them down there all the time when I'm visiting the Capitol. The kids are out there, the teachers are out there explaining. There's the Peace Officer Memorial, Vietnam, the firefighters, uh, all of these, all of these memorials, and the teachers are telling them about. Them. They need to tell these kids about John McCain. So. You, you mentioned the students, and I mistakenly squinting at the camera monitors in our studio thought that there were Red for Ed folks that were out uh, lining the streets as the, as the procession went by. It wasn't. A viewer corrected me and said that it's the entire Brophy student body. We know that McCain had Oh, their colors are red, yeah. Right, yeah. and so red with white letters, yeah. you can see the okay. confusion there. But it says a lot about, about you know, that next generation that, that is not in school today. Mm -hmm. right. They are out in the streets watching the remains of Senator John McCain these these children never knew the man. They never knew the senator. They're going to read about him on Wikipedia. But but I think your idea of putting a statue at Bowling Plaza, you know, if that inspires one kid to look up the life that this man lived, yep. it's, it's worth a while. And it does. It will. And if you are just joining our coverage right now, it is noon. The memorial service for Senator John McCain at the North Baptist Church just wrapped up moments ago. We are now following the recession on their way to Sky Harbor. I'm Emma Jade alongside Paul Gerke. We are joined by Arizona State Historian Marshall Trimble. So we are still waiting for them to arrive at Sky Harbor where they will then fly over to Washington. Senator John McCain's last flight to Joint Base Andrews for a series of more memorials. He'll lie in state at the U.S. Capitol tomorrow. He will then have a memorial service on Saturday at the National Cathedral. Former President Barack Obama and former President George W. Bush, two of the men that he ran against his presidential contenders, uh, they will be speaking, which is just incredible. Sunday, there will be a private burial in Annapolis, Maryland. They're stopping first at the 161st Air Refueling Wing, a unit of the Arizona Air National Guard at Goldwater. Air National Guard base at Phoenix Sky Harbor. Scheduled departure time around 1235, although we think that may be pushed back just a little bit if you're just joining our coverage because the memorial at North Phoenix Baptist Church ran a little long this morning. But, I mean, captivating in every way, shape, and form. The people that we're speaking about. I mean, let's we've, we've said some very serious and poignant things about John McCain over the last few days. But 
Larry Fitzgerald, a professional athlete, not an orator, not a senator, not a guy, a guy who speaks with you know, the physical capabilities of his body and not necessarily his words, still had some very, um, very strong takes about what made John who he was. He said that it's been a true honor to call you friend. Your love set an example and we're all better for having known you. This is a guy who is McCain's junior by roughly five decades. Mm -hmm. but still found a way to connect, even though, and Larry laid this all out in his tribute. I'm black, he's white. I've got dreads, he does not. <laughs> and, and he laid out all the differences yeah. between the two. One runs and one runs yeah. for the Runs out of bounds. <laughs> one yeah. runs for president, yeah. one runs out of I bounds. I think that was my favorite yeah. quote. Wasn't that yeah. so great? And the fact that John McCain would take the time to text Larry Fitzgerald. First of all, I want to know where he got his phone number because I, I, Larry's a tough man to get a hold of sometimes. <laughs> but, but with texting things like, you need to pick it up on Sunday. Yeah. Can you yeah. imagine Marshall being a professional athlete and getting a text from John McCain telling you to play better? It would make me play better. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't it? Yes, I think I'd so too. I'd be inspired. Yeah. Did you want that story I was going to tell? Oh, I'd love to hear it. We have the time? Yes, um, of course. It was 1985. Uh, I was Grand Marshal of the Parada del Sol in Scottsdale, the uh, horse, horse drawn parade. And uh, John was riding up front. Uh, we were both up in the front leading the parade. And uh, the biggest thunderstorm, biggest cloud, just, it just, it was raining. I got hit by three cats and a dog. Um, <laughs> and it was raining that much. And we had turned the corner uh, uh, leading down Scottsdale Road and that we were drenched. Uh, we were on horseback and we were soaked. I had a hat, the rain was going off my, but John didn't, John was bareheaded. <laughs> and we went, we rode about, we rode about a block and I looked back over the shoulder and I said, John, um, we're the only ones left in the parade. <laughs> they had canceled the parade. Uh, the only time in the history of the Parada del Sol that they that they canceled it because of a rain, and uh, we were we were the, about the only participants in that parade. And we rode we rode it all the way though. We we cowboyed up and we just said uh -huh. we're we're riding it out. So by the time we got we were just dripping wet. But and his hair was just hanging down. <laughs> so uh, great. And so it was that was the, that's my Parada del Sol story. Oh. They never asked me to be, uh, be Grand Marshal again. <laughs> <laughs> With a commitment like that, I'm not sure why they didn't. That's Marshall Trimble, Arizona State historian, uh, sharing an anecdote about Senator John McCain, whose casket has just arrived at Phoenix Sky Harbor. You're looking live at pictures right now. That's the plane that's about to take him out to Washington, D.C., a C-32 military aircraft flanked by Armed Forces body bearers. Scheduled departure time around 1235 right now. Our political correspondent, Bram Resnick, is in Washington, D.C. He will be there to see Senator McCain lying in state tomorrow. He'll be there for that memorial that we'd spoken of, um, including words by George W. Bush and former President Barack Obama as well. Yeah, 12 News anchor Mark Curtis will also be heading to Washington, D.C. later on today and continue our coverage as we follow the memorial services celebrating and honoring the life of Senator John McCain. Have you seen anything like this, like these memorial services for anyone else in Arizona? What can you liken this to? No, I, I, I was at Barry Goldwater's and Carl Hayden's and um, this was, this was, this was well. This was really moving. Just everything about it. I've never been. To, I've never been to a ceremony quite this. I love the military um, uh, pomp and ceremony yes. and, and, and the, the discipline of the military uh, um, memorials. Memorials and. And uh, yeah, this was uh, this was really special. This is historic. We want to send it out now to Bram Resnick, who is live right now in Washington, D.C., where McCain's body will arrive in just a couple of hours. Bram, what can you tell us? Point Base Andrews in suburban Maryland. It's where we expect uh, the McCain party to arrive at 7.30 p.m. local time, that's 4.30 uh, in Arizona. Uh, the vice, uh, the McCains are taking flying Air Force Two here. That is the plane reserved for the Vice President of the United States. It is outfitted for the Vice President of the United States. The McCain family, as well as the Senator's casket, are aboard that plane. Again, should be here at 7.30 p.m. local time. It represents one more honor among many of the honors we've seen so far during these last two days. Uh, the honor accorded him of the plane, the vice president's plane, arriving here at Joint Base Andrews. And let's just kind of move over there so you can see the road. You can see the road to Joint Base Andrews. 
Uh, it's one more of the honors, a military honor, to land at the place where presidents come and go and where our soldiers come home to rest. Uh, they come home from war. So again, we're expecting the McCain family to return here, to arrive here about 7.30 p.m. Maryland time, D.C. time, 4.30 p.m. in Arizona. And you'll recall that Senator McCain left Washington, D.C. eight months ago, last December, to go home to Arizona for cancer treatment. Uh, he now returns, as I said, on one of the last legs, uh, leading up to his burial on Monday at an on sorry, excuse me, on Sunday at the Naval Academy. All right, thank you very much, Bram. Let's go back out live to Phoenix Sky Harbor right now where it looks like everyone is loaded out of that motorcade as they remove the uh, remains of Senator John McCain from the back of the hearse to put him aboard that C-32 military aircraft. You know, Mark Curtis, I think, was the first one to bring this up in our coverage. This is a flight that he's made many, many times. Right. And this will be the last in it, and I hadn't really thought about it like that before. It's hard to believe, isn't it? It's hard to believe that this is the last time Senator John McCain will be in Arizona. As much as he said that Arizona had enchanted him, you know, this is his final farewell. One last aerial view from a few thousand feet in the air. To Someone who served his country, not only you know as a senator, but uh, I mean, part of the military. It's just you. This is where he needs to be. The fact that he's being buried right next to one of his best friends. Let's watch as they they give their final farewell. As all of us as Arizonans give our final farewell to the late Senator John McCain.
Thanks. A flight Senator John McCain has made many times from Arizona to Washington, but this, the last one. It's unbelievable to be part of this, be part of today and realizing that this is the last time. Marshall Trimble, Arizona State Historian, what are, you, what are your thoughts? Well, I'm feeling pretty sad. <laughs> Wish we could have. He loved Arizona like Barry Goldwater. You know, if we talk about Barry Goldwater's love for Arizona, well, nobody loved Arizona any more than John McCain. And uh, sad to see him go for the last time. We might not ever see anybody like him in our lifetime again, sadly. We saw family members board the plane just moments ago, Cindy and his seven children, everyone getting on board for the memorial services that will be taking place in Washington over the next couple of days. Let's listen in one more time. We're expected a departure of this C-32 military aircraft around 1235, approximately 20 minutes from now. You saw some of McCain's family board that aircraft, which is headed to Washington, D.C., where McCain will lie in state at the U.S. Capitol Rotunda, just the 31st individual in the history of our nation to be bestowed that honor. Speaks volumes about what he's done for this country. Saturday, he'll have another memorial service and be laid to rest Sunday in a private ceremony. Coming up on Saturday is when you will hear from former President Barack Obama and former President George W. Bush, two men that, of course, you know, in 2000, President George W. Bush at the time beat out him in the Republican nomination, and then 2008, when he went up against President Barack Obama, he made those personal phone calls to those men to ask them if they would speak at his funeral. Marshall, we've spoken at great length about John McCain's political career. Do you think that those two defeats in the presidential elections were something that really weighed on him more so than he let on? I think he wanted to be president. Uh, he really fought for it. He, he, he fought hard against George W. Bush in 2000. It was a tough campaign, tough one to lose. And um, I think he, uh, I, I think he knew that the, the, the cards might be against him uh, in in the 2008 because, generally speaking, in this country, two terms, and we, and we want to see what the other side can do, 
And uh, besides, Barack Obama represented youth. Right. And John was would have been the oldest elected president uh, had he won. But it was it was more and, and, and Obama was dynamic and he was uh, he, he was uh, charismatic as as was McCain. But uh, but he he had this youthful side to him and this youthful enthusiasm. And uh, I think I think John uh, it reminded me of Barry Goldwater in 1964, and he told me himself to personally a couple of times that he said he he knew that America would not change presidents three times in a year, and he knew that he 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 knew he was almost a sacrificial uh, candidate there because because he just they wouldn't Americans wouldn't go for three presidents in one year. But even knowing that, I mean, there's that that famous clip of John McCain defending Barack Obama. Yes. You know, and I think that even knowing that, even knowing what he was up against, having the, just the character to defend someone when he knew that the comment made was wrong, says so much. As he said, it was the right thing to do. And it was the right thing to do. Yes. That person uh, that, that said what she said uh, was out of order. And you it was that, uncalled for. You saw that a lot with Senator John McCain, that even when things were maybe not the popular thing to say or maybe not, you know, admitting defeat, all of those things, he, he would do that. He was okay doing that because in his eyes, it was the right thing to do. Well, he himself said a lot of things that in the light of, of the way this country has progressed, especially um, regarding race and, and sex, John McCain said some things that, that don't look good in 2018, but he's not a man that ever held steadfastly to a statement that proved later to be ignorant or, or offensive. Yeah. This is a man that apologized when he mm -hmm. made mistakes. Yes, yes. Yeah. which is so, I mean, you don't see that a lot in politicians, in, in anyone, you know, a lot of yeah. people aren't willing to be humble and to swallow pride, but you saw that time and time again with him, and I think that's such a great lesson and something for us as Arizonans to be so proud of that we had a politician that was willing to do that. He had a sense of honor too, and I think part of part of honor is being able to admit you were wrong, mm -hmm. and uh, and he t take the high road. Right. That I think was exemplified in the way that he conducted himself around Joe Biden. We got a snippet of it. I wish I could have listened to Biden talk all day. He said he thought of John as family, and they were in a hell of a lot of family fights. Oh, I love that too. <laughs> you know, that's and, and, so great. But, but that speaks to the way he treated his colleagues. It, it's, sure. It's. You know, family is blood. Family's forever. So mm -hmm. you, you could get in an argument with your family members tonight, and you're going to love them the same tomorrow. He told the story about Ted Kennedy, and I wish I could remember the other senator uh, that they would be fighting on the Senate floor, and then they would go to lunch Eastman. right after. East, it was Eastman. Eastman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they would go to lunch after, and he says that he's not seeing that anymore. And I think no. that was the moment when he stopped and he spoke to the other senators that were in the room about how much we need that, how much we need that civility and we need that love and that respect for one another because it, when it, what it all comes down to is that we're all fighting for a better America. And I think yes. that's something that Senator John McCain never forgot. If you're just joining our coverage at 1220 Arizona time, the body and casket of Senator John McCain has been loaded into the aircraft you're seeing on the right side of your screen right now at Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport. Scheduled departure time for Washington, D.C., 1235. Foreground here is Terminal 3 of Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport, which the Phoenix City Council recently voted to rename the John S. McCain 3 Terminal, a fitting tribute for his final flight, departing his favorite state. This is a historic moment in when we look back for all of Arizona, this moment right here, saying goodbye to, for the last time, having Senator John McCain here in our state. He's been our senator for six terms. You know, Grant Wood said it best. He never lost in Arizona. He, people here loved him, and he loved Arizona right back. He loved the people in the community. He loved the Grand Canyon. He loved the Colorado River. He loved Sedona. He made this place not just home. He made this his heart. He also joked about what a bad driver John McCain was, which is not something I knew. <laughs> well, then he fit right in. That says Arizona. a lot about this. Yeah. Yes, he fit right in on our roads. Yeah. <laughs> I think something else that Grant Wood said that I really, that really spoke to a lot of people, that Arizonans saw in John McCain an embodiment of values that they hoped to see in their country, which Grant uh, alluded to why people, time and time again, kept him in, in office. And that's because they believed in the values that he upheld under some of the worst circumstances. 
you know, I, th I, I look back at his time as a POW and the chance that he had to, to leave early when his, uh, when his father was made an admiral and that he did not because there were other men who had been in that camp longer than him who were not going to leave. I think that alone says so much about this man's character. Yeah, and it is the code of conduct in the military. Um, last one in, last one out. Right. <laughs> right here on the right side of your screen, you see the last few people that were there for the ceremony at uh, Phoenix uh, Baptist Church being uh, boarding the plane right now, so we're expecting a departure uh, imminently. We're being joined, um, I'm Paul Gerke alongside Emma Jade, being joined by Marshall Trimble, Arizona State Historian right now. Marshall, knowing what you know about the McCain family, do you think, and this might be a little too soon to discuss this, but do you think there's a future in politics for, for his boys, Jimmy and Jack? If they want to. Yeah. yeah. And um, they've got it in the genes. It's in their genes. Sure <laughs> is. That. And, and uh, I would say, I, I would say, let's don't rule them out. Uh, John always made a point not to talk about the service records of his son. It's a point that, that we hit on yesterday. Um, but now, you know, they're front and center. There's no shadow. I, there will always be a, a metaphorical shadow left yeah. by John McCain. Yeah. That, that's his seat will never be filled, you know, no matter who comes after him. But that said, I think his sons now, um, if, if they were interested in such a thing, really stand in kind of a unique position to, to position themselves politically. They could. I, I, I haven't uh, heard anything about it. Yeah. But I yeah. don't know it well. Right now, they're, uh, they're in the military. Joe Biden spoke to them directly during his, uh, his remarks today during the service. He said, you may not have had your father as long as you would have liked, but you got from him everything you need to pursue your own dreams, to follow the course of your own spirit. You're a living legacy and proof of John McCain's success. I think that says a lot, and I think it, it challenges. I mean, he has seven, seven children who are all successful, and we all know Meghan McCain, and, uh, and there's two sons who are serving, and other son who's you know, part of the Hensley Corporation. It's just, it will be interesting to watch them and to see how their lives almost patterned after their father's lives and the decisions that they make to try and keep his legacy alive. Marshall, you've been an incredible guest, and I'm going to have to put you on the spot one last time here. How do you think Senator John McCain viewed himself, if he could take a look back at the course of his, his service and his political career, how do you think he would sum it up? He had such an exemplary career and, and, and a life. It, it was a he, he had nine lives, I think, really. He and said some of his final words, I was not cheated. Yeah, <laughs> and I think I think he had to be happy with himself. And I I saw uh, I saw him mellow uh, uh, in 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 the late in the last few years. He really mellowed, and I thought he became more of a statesman and more reflective, as you do when you get older. Mm -hmm. um, I know I'm not I'm almost as old as he is, <laughs> and you start reflecting on. Uh, I hope I I hope I was good. I hope I earned it. I hope I li I hope I lived right. I hope I lived a good life. If I helped others and and I think I, I think he, ha he he had to die knowing that you know a lot of people on social media are talking about uh, the song that was played during his recessional my way by Frank Sinatra why do you think that song chosen for a purpose I'm sure uh, because he really believed he did yeah. a, a really in his heart or well he, he really believed he he really believed he did it his way and it was a great song uh, it's it says it all it says it all about his life what a way to end it here in Arizona. Thank you for joining us for this 12 News breaking news uh, update. We're just waiting for the departure of the C-32 military aircraft you see on the right side of your screen, containing the remains of Senator John McCain as it heads to Washington, D.C., where another day of memorials and tributes is on tap in the rotunda tomorrow, and then again at another ceremony on Saturday. Some more popular things that we're seeing right now as we monitor the reaction on social media is uh, everyone reacting to Larry Fitzgerald's remarks. You know, even when we were sitting here talking about, you know, Larry following Grant Woods, who was incredible, Tommy Espinoza, who, I mean, just the stories they shared. If you missed part of that, we have it available for you on 12 News right now, so you can go back and watch it. Do yourself a favor, but Larry, hearing his story and hearing how he was actually compelled to visit Vietnam. I didn't know I didn't this know about that either. Larry. I knew that Larry was becoming a bit more of a world traveler. Yes. I know he, he made a few stops this off season, including out to South Korea, um, where he took in some Olympic action. He said he sat in the cell, sat he saw the, cell, the lake, yeah. mm -hmm. he saw the lake where lake. he was shot down. 
to have that perspective. I mean, no wonder they were such close friends because it seems like they really took the time to understand each other as different as they were, to understand each other and to appreciate each other's values. I thought that was so incredible. I didn't know that he had gone to Vietnam. Marshall, when John spoke about his time in Vietnam years after the fact, do you, do you think he softened up on, on, on what he experienced there, or, or was it still as, as poignant as we all imagine it to be? Um, do you mean as far as making peace with the yes, North Vietnamese? Yes, making peace with, with the horrors that he endured there. Yeah, uh, I, think, I think he did. Time, time heals wounds. And uh, he, I got a kick out of his humor uh, when he said uh, that uh, he, th these missiles they fired at him, the, the sky was just full of missiles when he was flying over, over Hanoi. Yeah. And uh, he said they were about the size of telephone poles. And he says, I stopped one of them by ramming my plane into it. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a lot to have a sense of humor yeah. about being shot down over That's Vietnam. That's right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, really but I thought though. that was a classic McCain, uh, classic McCain remark. He made several trips back to Vietnam. Oh yeah, didn't he? yeah. That's why I say he made peace with that too, and uh, he met the officers, you know, that was at the prison camp, and I don't know if he met the one they called the cat, but I think uh, he he was the uh, holy terror. Um, but uh, but he did he did go back, and and they. And they honored him, I thought. Yeah, and you know, we've done some coverage of the Vietnamese community here and how they honored him. I mean, here in Arizona, they had a candlelit vigil and they did quite a few, quite a few things to remember and to honor his legacy because he did a lot for the Vietnamese communities here in Arizona and across the country. It's incredible to have that, to turn around that experience and to make it something positive and good for the people here in America and for over in Vietnam, I think it's just Well, it shows what a... What, how big a man he was, I yes, think. Yes, to rise above all mm, of that sure. and to, to bring progress. Because having hate just drags on you after a while. You've got to, get, you've got to figure out a way to get rid of it. And there, must, there had to be a lot of hate in when you come back from after that treatment for those people. For and, five and a half years. Yeah, and you just have to purge that and, and, and get past it or it'll, 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 it, it's like a disease for you. I think service is the best way, the best medicine. Yeah. And that's what he devoted his entire life to was service to his country and to, I mean, especially here in Arizona, we have so much to be thankful yeah. for. You may have heard the engines fire up a little bit yep. out there at Phoenix Sky Harbor. They're getting ready for departure, originally scheduled for 1235, just about five minutes and change from now as John McCain heads out to Washington, D.C. We want to set the stage for you a little bit on what's going to happen next as we wrap up all of the memorials and the ceremonies that have happened here in Arizona. A little tough to realize that we're going to have to let him go, Senator John McCain, that we're going to send him over to Washington now. To give you an idea of what happens next, he will fly over to Joint Base Andrews. Political insider, uh, Bram Resnick, he is there. We're going to make, check in with him in just a few minutes to kind of get an idea on what's happening there and also the significance of flying into Joint Base Andrews. Tomorrow, on Friday, he will lie in state at the U.S. Capitol. And you mentioned this before, Paul. This is not uh, a small thing. I mean, to lie in state at the U.S. Capitol is quite the honor. Well, he lied in state at the Arizona State Capitol, and he was just the third person since 1980 to do that. So a pretty distinct honor in Arizona, although that was a more popular decision back in the founding of our state. Mm -hmm. But just to be the 31st in the country to lie in the U.S. Capitol in state, not, not an honor. Some private citizens have laid an honor. That number's a little larger. But to lie in state is a real distinction. Uh, Marshall, do you know off the top of your head a few others that have lied in honor at the, at the U.S. Capitol to, to, uh, to place him amongst their ranks? Douglas MacArthur and Dwight Eisenhower. Um, I mean, former presidents. There's, there's yeah. a list of former presidents. I believe almost a half a dozen of them have sure. lied in state. Mm -hmm. But a Capitol. senator. Yeah. Well, no, uh, he, he was more than that. Yeah. <laughs> to this country. I mean, sure. He was, uh, he was so many more, th much, he's so much more than that. Uh, but yeah, um, well, we've got generals like MacArthur and, um, uh, and I imagine Marshall, General Marshall. Uh, I'm not, I'm, ta I'm, just, I'm just assuming that the, because these sure. were truly great men, mm -hmm. uh, the Marshall Plan and George Marshall was the, uh, uh, the uh, chief of, of, of operations throughout World War II. And so uh, these are people who uh, are, they're giants. Yes, NBC News and Today Show have been covering this story heavily. I mean, their presence here in Arizona, 
they have reporters all over and now that they're heading over to Washington I know that their coverage will continue uh, earlier this morning they were talking about how big this story is and how how big the late Senator John McCain his passing is to the country especially right now especially the political climate right now yeah I hope all these small small people out there who criticized him when he was even after he was ill I hope they're uh, I hope they're listening to all these tributes because it, it, it makes them it, 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 it sort of minimizes what they said yeah. you're looking on the left side of your screen the military service men and women uh, standing at attention right now as we await the departure of that C-32 military aircraft. Just doing a little research here, the first leader to receive the honor of lying in state at the U.S. Capitol mm -hmm. was Henry Clay, the former Speaker of the House of Representatives, when he passed in 1852. And since then, it's been extended to just 30 people, and 11 of them were presidents of the United States. So that shows the elite company that John McCain he is. is. He certainly is. Yeah. I mean, we're talking Abraham Lincoln was the second to lie in state at the U.S. Capitol. The last to do it was um, was the president pro, pro tempore of the U.S. Senate, uh, Senator of Hawaii, Daniel uh, Inouye. 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 Yeah, in 2012. And before that, it was Gerald Ford and then Reagan before him. Can you believe that? That our, our Senator John McCain, Arizona's, will be lying in state tomorrow at the U.S. Capitol. It's pretty incredible. And when he was here, 15,000 people went out to go pay their respects yesterday yes, was, from all over the country. quite a tribute, yeah. When you look back at all this, Marshall, what, what was the most moving to you, uh, uh, you know, considering the two memorials we've had in Arizona uh, yesterday and today? Ooh. I think, uh, uh, I think watching the family was moving to me. I, I was just sitting here watching the watching the monitor on the on the plane, and I was, I was my, I was thinking about what they must be, thinking what's going through their minds right now. And they're just they're great people, and um, and but I think the speeches we heard today uh, were were really were really moving. And again, we we use that word a lot, but it's the diversity, mm -hmm. uh, the diversity of these speakers were ever bit as diverse as John McCain was. And uh, you spent quite a bit of time with the senator. How when he talked about his family, how how was he? Did he light up or what? Because I mean, it seems like such a close knit group. They were. And you could tell. And he was, he's a family man. He is, he is a family man. And w mostly when, when we talked, it was always about Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about Arizona. He was trying to catch up on all the history <laughs> that you had for him. Trying to figure yesterday. out how to, if the rain's going to stop. Right. This, these are images from yesterday at the uh, Arizona State Capitol. And this his is, family paid uh, their final respects. This is when she pressed her, pressed her face against the flag. Yeah. That was on the front page of the paper this morning. Mm -hmm. That was a pretty powerful image yeah. for sure. Well, I think that's an iconic image. I think we're going to see that for a long time. That, Is this that one of those days right? you save the newspaper? Yeah. 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 Uh, it's already put away. <laughs> right. Poor Megan, she really taken that hard. I can't imagine what the family must be going through, especially considering it's not just one memorial service like you or it's, I would it's a, it's Yeah, it's, it's a marathon, and uh, that's, what I th that's what I was thinking when I was looking at the plane just now, that they're sitting in there, and, mm -hmm. and there's, there's more to go. There's more to come, and, uh, it, and it, it sort of it it would be a bigger thing in Washington. Right. It would be private at, uh, at Annapolis, mm -hmm. so it would be more of a, a well, less... And you know what, I'm, I'm thankful that they have that time, to have that private time, because they have had to share their dad with the world for so long. He's yes, devoted his yes. life to service, but to have that private time to really say goodbye at Annapolis, I think will be so special. I, I think so too. It's so yeah. important for them too, you know, to really get some good closure on that. And the time at Cornville, the time they got to go yeah. to the ranch at Cornville uh, here, uh, it, it, it wasn't like uh, John F. Kennedy where he, he it was gone in an instant, mm -hmm. uh, and they've had time to sort of adjust. Uh, uh, you never adjust to it all the way. It's mm -hmm. never, but a family that close. But they've had a they've had a chance to really prepare themselves. Looks like they're pulling back the stairs right now on the right part of your screen as they prepare for departure. In the foreground, the John S. McCain the third terminal, that C-32 bound for Washington D.C. One final time with Senator John McCain aboard. 
We're still waiting on more details on exactly who makes up this group here. Producers, if you have that, if you can share that information with us. But we know that, I mean, to, to be out there, to be part of this historic moment, what an honor. Unwavering there, standing completely still for the last half an hour or so as we've waited for the plane to get ready to take off. You know, I thought Joe Biden said something else. And we've quoted him a few times already over the last half an hour on this broadcast. but. To your point a moment ago, Emma, he touched so many lives. The world shares with you the ache of John's mm -hmm. death. And what Biden said right after that, that when you think of his memory and a smile crosses your face before a tear reaches your eye, oh. that's how you'll know, um, you know, that, that you finally found a way to move on um, and appreciate, you know, what, what John was able to do. Right now, we want to send things over to Bram Resnick, our political insider with 12 News. He's at Joint Base Andrews in Maryland with more details on exactly what's going to happen in the coming days. Bram, what can you tell us? Uh, well, I can tell you within the next uh, three or four hours or so, a plane carrying John McCain's casket as well as his family. As well, I'm just learning Governor Doug Ducey is on that plane. Uh, they will be landing at Joyce Base, Joint Base Andrews at 7.30 local time. That's 4.30 Arizona time. Might be delayed based on what I'm hearing uh, you guys say. Uh, this is another one of the honors uh, we've been talking about for the last few days. Uh, he is flying a plane that has a military tag on it, but it is normally used as Air Force Two. You can see by the markings, it looks like Air Force Two. Inside, it, it is outfitted for the Vice President of the United States. So will be flying that plane uh, on the second leg of John McCain's final journey. Uh, he's back in D.C. after being away for about eight months. Uh, they'll be arriving here at 7.30 uh, local time and then proceeding to the Capitol, we believe. And John McCain, of course, if you say, as you said, will be lying in state there tomorrow. Bram, I know that you have been, I mean, alongside McCain the past 15 years covering his career. What, what are some of the things that you'll take away from the, mem the memorial service today here in Phoenix? Uh, you know, the, the theme everybody seems to be gathering around, gathering around is uh, service and honor and standing up for what's right. And that's, that's been consistent throughout the last few days. You know, I was just in his office today uh, checking in with some of the staffers there. Uh, it's a bare bone staff. Many of the folks are here right now. And, you know, they are in awe of the man. There's one, one of them, a young man, I'd say about 25, he'd say, he told me, you know, people sit in that chair. And he was pointing to the chair of the first person who anybody sees when they walk into that office. And it was a young woman, I'd say in her 20s. Companies will hire that person as an executive once they're done with John Graham, McCain. I've got to interrupt you for just a second. You know, the military personnel out at John Phoenix McCain. Sky Harbor right now are standing and saluting as the plane departs, containing the casket of Senator John McCain as he leaves his beloved state of Arizona one last time and makes that one final flight out to Washington, D.C. Joe Biden said in his tribute to John McCain, quoting some of McCain's final words, believe always in the promise and greatness of America because nothing is inevitable here. Something that Mark Curtis touched on, this is a flight that Senator John McCain made often from Phoenix to Washington. But this, this flight right here, the very last one, the very last time we will have Senator John McCain in Arizona, a man who served our state to the best that he possibly could. And Grant Woods said it so beautifully. Arizona loved him. We embrace the man who moved here late in his life, but spent the rest of it serving this great state and how lucky are we to have had him here. This is a part of history, everyone. And we thank you for joining us here and being part of this moment as we say goodbye to our Senator, the late John McCain. Vaya con Dios.
The state of Arizona says goodbye one last time to Senator John McCain III, who served our state for 36 years and served our country for six decades. On their way now to Joint Base Andrews in Maryland, where right now we have our 12 News political insider, Bram Resnick, who has more information on the what's next, because we're not done remembering this man. We're not done saying our goodbyes and the memorials continue with some some beautiful ceremonies that are planned over the next couple of days. Bram, what are we expecting at you know tomorrow while he lies in state at the rotunda and what are we expecting on Saturday? Uh, well, tomorrow uh, in the rotunda, we're expecting Vice President Mike Pence, as well as the leadership of Congress, uh, Mitch McConnell, Paul Ryan, Chuck Schumer, Nancy Pelosi, all to uh, speak about John McCain. Uh, it's significant that President Trump is not there. He has said Mike Pence will be his, his representative. So there will be that part of the ceremony. Some dignitaries will go uh, into the Capitol Rotunda before that to view the casket. And then the public will be let in uh, to view the casket. That is expected to last all day long. Uh, the next day, Saturday morning, that will start with Cindy McCain and the motorcade driving, uh, driving past the Vietnam Memorial, where Cindy McCain will lay a wreath. That is not expected to last very long. A very quick ceremony, acknowledgement, of course, of John, uh, John McCain's POW service. She'll lay that wreath on the way to the National Cathedral, where Saturday there will be uh, a ceremony we have haven't seen in a very, very long time in this country. Uh, it is not a funeral, it is a memorial service. It will be led by D Democratic President, former President Barack Obama, and Republican, former President George W. Bush. They are among the speakers there. There will be many others. Uh, that will be uh, probably one of the biggest services Washington has seen. I will add this, NBC News is reporting that John McCain's 106-year-old mother, his 106-year-old mother, Roberta McCain, will be attending every service, that she will be at the Rotunda for the viewing. She will be at National Cathedral for that memorial. And then on Sunday, she will also be at the Naval Academy for his burial. Paul, Emma? Yeah, Bram, I wanted to talk about that decision to be buried at the, uh, the Naval Academy instead of Arlington. Why do you think that decision was made? Uh, I think it's just John McCain's affinity for the Naval Academy and, you know, what they call the class of 58. This is a very tight-knit bunch, uh, many of them high achievers. Uh, some of them were POWs themselves, uh, but they've obviously remained tight over the years. They call themselves the class of 58. He's being buried next to his good friend Chuck Larson, who at one point was the president, the, I think, of the Naval Academy, led the Naval Academy. Chuck Larson also held the same rank, Pacific Fleet Commander, that John McCain's father held when John McCain was imprisoned in Vietnam. So they have a connection that goes way back to the class of 58. Ch Chuck Larson was the number one student, that was, as we've said many times. John McCain finished fourth or fifth at the bottom, yet Chuck Larson was always in John McCain's company. Now Chuck Larson did purchase four burial plots at the Naval Academy side by side for Chuck Larson and his wife and John McCain and his wife. So this was in the works. Uh, this has been planned. Uh, Chuck Larson died a few years ago, I believe in 2015 or so, uh, of cancer. Uh, and now his running mate, his comrade, John McCain, will join him. Bram, we all had the chance to listen to the remarks from those who gave tributes to John McCain today, among them uh, Biden, who was vice president to Barack Obama. <laughs> What are you anticipating Obama saying about McCain and the man that he was? Well, one thing to know, uh, you know, it's been reported that John McCain called Barack Obama out of the blue uh, in May and said, I'd like you to deliver the eulogy at my funeral. Uh, and the two of them were not close. Uh, if you recall, 2008, that was a pretty tense campaign. Words were exchanged. Uh, after Barack Obama won, John McCain was a very, very tough critic on his foreign policy. Uh, but there was a mutual respect there. That did come out uh, several times. And even though they weren't close, there was that respect. And it's clear when you look at every, every ceremony, every one of these ceremonies we have seen and will see, there was an intent in every one of them regarding who the pallbearers would be, who the speakers would be, and the message John McCain wanted to send. Perhaps to Donald Trump, 
more importantly, I think, to the country at large. And by having Barack Obama there side by side with George W. Bush, a man Barack Obama criticized vehemently when he ran, it says a lot about bipartisanship and the need for bipartisanship in this country, and that is clearly a message John McCain wants to send. Bram, I had another question for you. The significance of lying in state at the U.S. Capitol. Talk a little bit about that. For this to happen for Senator John McCain, I mean, how significant is that? Uh, you know, well, the big thing to see here, th th everything we're seeing has the trappings of a state funeral. John McCain ran twice for president and lost. What we're seeing today might have been very similar to what the kind of funeral and services he would have had had he won. Mm -hmm. It has all the trappings of that. Nothing is missing. So, uh, you know, as we continue on, I think you'll see more of that. Uh, the state funeral, the lying in state. And when it comes to lying in state, we just got a lesson today from a, a Senate historian uh, briefing us on that. It's often misused, but lying in state is largely reserved for presidents and members of Congress and some other distinguished Americans. Uh, many of the people we refer to as lying in state uh, aren't lying in state. It's a, a lesser uh, designation. Um, they are distinguished Americans, but it doesn't rise to the level. You know, so what we're seeing is tells you all about John McCain's significance, how he's viewed by his peers, and how he's viewed by his country. Bram Resnick, live in Washington, D.C., outside of Joint Base Andrews in Maryland right now, rather. Bram, we're looking forward to your reports coming up a little yeah. later today and uh, this weekend. Mark Curtis audience. will be joining him, too, so just goes to show how significant this is. And to continue our coverage of these memorials and these services, we have a lot to look forward to over the next couple of days as the nation and the country honor our guy, Senator John McCain. I'm not a native Arizonan. I've only seen what John McCain has had to offer this country from afar, but listening to the speakers today and seeing the memorial service yesterday, uh, I'm left with the impression that Grant Woods summed up um, in his tribute today that he saw in John McCain a lot of what people had hoped to see in themselves and in their mm -hmm. country. And Tommy Espinosa echoed that as well um, when he said that we all make America great. John McCain didn't care about your race. He didn't care about how much money you had in your bank account. He only cared about the contents of your heart and that he reflected love. And I hope that all of our viewers who have joined us for this breaking news coverage today go out and reflect a little of that love back today. It's a hard day for Arizonans because we just said goodbye. It's real now to the late Senator John McCain. Joe Biden said on John McCain, we shall not see his like again, but boy, do I hope we can all take a little bit of that, that we love so much about Senator John McCain and be a little bit more like him. We wanna thank you so much for being part of this historic day here in Arizona, for joining us right here on 12 News, and we will continue our coverage honoring Senator John McCain. So, you didn't sleep last night? All you can hear is that drippity drip drip of that faucet? Maybe it's time to call Plumbing Masters, home of the Smell Good Plumber. And if you call before 9, there's no service charge. Get Plumbing Masters, get that leak fixed, and get some sleep tonight. Like you, my days can be pretty stressful. The constant running around, navigating traffic, scheduling meetings, and dealing with paperwork. We all need to de-stress. That's why I go to Hand and Stone Massage and Facial Spas. They have lots of convenient locations, great hours, and it's super affordable. So I'm relaxed and ready for a little overtime. With massage and facials from $59.95, it's easy to make Hand and Stone part of your routine. Let the Labor Day weekend fun begin with sensational savings from Bashes. Perfect for the barbecue. USDA choice T-bone steak, just $4.97 a pound. Sweet and juicy mountain-grown Utah peaches are only 97 cents a pound. Refreshing 12 packs of your favorite Pepsi products are four for just $10 with a $25 purchase. And 12 packs of Corona, Heineken, or Dos Equis beer are just $10.99. Enjoy a fun and safe Labor Day from Bashes, your Arizona hometown grocer.
Right now, you're probably asking if you can make it through another Arizona summer. The bigger question is, are you using the right AC company? One who understands that great service means more than just taking care of your AC unit. It means knowing how your home's entire system works together, from the insulation to the ductwork, backed by a guarantee to make your home more comfortable and energy efficient. The answer is Rias, where we're always thinking outside the box. Call for your free home performance evaluation. And remember, it's hard to stop a train. Learn more at Rias.com. So you still haven't called Plumbing Masters about that leak. Remember, when you call before 9, there's no service fee. But don't just call any plumbing company.